very good afternoon to everyone present over here i would like to welcome you all for the session 2 of third international conference of integrative chemistry biology and translational medicine icbtm 3.0 the core of invited lecture is biology of infectious disease and drug discovery second i would like to welcome dr ds rawat as a chairman professor d s rawat vice chancellor of kumon university nanital earned his master there in 1993 after his phd at central drug research institute lucknow he did post doc at indina and purdue university usa he has been an assistant professor at naipo moali and joined delhi university in 2003 with 166 plus research papers a book five chapters and 11 patents professor rawat work has 7000 plus citations boosting and edge index of 49 and i10 index of 132 one of his compounds is in phase 1 trial for parkinson's treatment he served as president of chemical sections of indian science congress 2019 to 2020 and is a visiting professor at japan advanced institute of science and technology i would like to request dr preeti kumar to felicitate dr ds rawat I like to welcome Dr. Preeti Kumar to felicitate Dr. K. C. Pandey, ICMR National Institute of Malaria Research, Bharat. I like to welcome Dr. Preeti Kumar to welcome Dr. Agam P. Singh, National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi, Bharat. I like to welcome Dr. Preeti Kumar to welcome Dr. Anand N. Bhatt, scientist, scientist at INMAS DRDO, Delhi, Bharat. I like to welcome Dr. Preeti Kumar to welcome Professor Ajit Jaiswal, DHS GSU, Bharat. Now I would like to. Uh, held held over the session to Dr. D. S. Rawat. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, four speakers uh, in this session: uh, Professor K. C. Pandey, uh, Dr. Agam P. Singh, Dr. Anand N. Bhatt, and then uh, Dr. Ajit Jaiswal. Uh, each of the speakers will have uh, 30 minutes, and five minutes before, I will just. Uh, or uh, give the time that you have five more minutes and i humbly request all the speakers uh, try to stick with the time so the first speaker of this session is uh, dr k c pandey he is the senior scientist at icmr national institute of malaria uh, research and he has been uh, uh, the research scholar of welcome trust at university in united kingdom then associate scientist at university of california san francisco and he has also worked in the division of infectious disease in united states and visiting postdoctoral scholar at university uh, at school of medicine san francisco general hospital and he is going to talk today on recent update on anti malarial parasite protease or potential target dr pandey please
hello good afternoon so basically thank you you know uh, the organizer for this wonderful meeting and thank you chair for his kind introduction so i will start uh, basically our work which we have done i think 5 6 year ago and then i will tell you know the uh, discuss about what we are doing presently so that uh, so presently we are working on how we can uh, how we can you know uh, make a drug drug against this uh, cysteine protein which is very well known in uh, malaria parasites so if you see my next slide so this is you know people who are you know all uh, the graduate students so this is very simple you know this uh, parasite go around all the human and mosquito so we'll i will discuss about how we are targeting this stage blood stage uh, and uh, different proteins uh, of this parasite so and if you see here this is the blood cycle and there are different uh, phenomena like invasion and uh, and the uh, hemoglobin hydrolysis in and there's a rupture so these uh, very distinct phenomena of parasites when it is invade the red blood cells and it has different proteases you can see here cysteine protease aspartic and and uh, and other like uh, metalloprotease and here the in case of hemoglobin hydrolysis we are focusing on cysteine proteases how these uh, we have worked i think 4 5 6 year here uh, to to know that what is the function of those cysteine proteins and how we can target them so and there are other phenomena like ruptures with this is also you know governed by some of the cysteine and aspartic proteins but i will focus my talk on uh, cysteine proteins how these can be targeted and what are the role of those proteins so this is uh, and if you see this is i think we have worked like uh, very long uh, Uh, uh work for this enzyme which is very well known if you see the literature here this enzyme is completely dissected like what is the role of this uh, the arm kind of you know which is uh, attracting the hemoglobins and this is the trafficking domain which you know once in synthesized to the uh, er it goes all the way to food vacuums so then it may it activate and here the inhibitory domain kind of sitting inside the active site and when parasite don't want this protein the pro domain goes into the active site and it become inactive so this is a kind of all phenomena different and this is the domain which is required for refolding of the this enzyme so the good thing is this falciparin 2 and 3 they degrade almost more than 70% of hemoglobin which is this initiate the hemoglobin degradation then other uh, like other uh, proteins are involved in aspartic protease and metalloprotease i think you heard about falciparin which is come later you know in in inaugural talk that uh, that that this protein so now we know lot of thing about this enzyme and if you see sorry uh yeah if you see you know this different inhibitor so this is all these are the big molecule you know which is sitting inside the parasite and they regulate those this enzyme all like segasin in tripuzuma cruzii and this is in bergeii and this is in again tripuzuma cruzii no this is in human and this is in falciparum so these all macro molecule are inhibiting these enzymes so when you know parasite is kind of very smart when parasite don't want to use them they you know synthesize at that stage where it don't want to use them and they inhibit these uh, enzyme in all sitting to the active site here and if you see these are the small molecule e64 binding to the active site and vinyl sulfone is binding to the active site of this enzyme and finally this leucoptin so these are all small molecule how they are sitting in the active site but now the good thing is because this enzyme is highly characterized so now gsk is coming with very potent inhibitor like 100 picomol to 200 picomol so uh, as uh, i think they clear the pre clinical the, there is a three uh, they have a target molecule one two are from cysteine proteases and one are from plasma plasma cysteine uh, 10 so they they have cleared the pre clinical so they are now although it's not combined with the artemisinin because you know artemisinin need hemoglobin degradation to activate but they are saying they will use you know the cocktail or they will combine aspartic or cystic protease this kind of combination so but definitely within a couple of year you will see you know this kind of information uh, you will see you know cystic proteases or aspartic proteases are you know the inhibitor are very potent inhibitor are coming into the into the you know uh, uh, our society so that is the one thing and uh, now we talk about you know this enzyme little bit so how this you know happen this is the model how enzyme it degrade the hemoglobin and if you see this is the wild type either falciparin or 2 this is the active site and this arm is attracting the hemoglobin here 
and you can see once it is attacked by this side, it goes to the active side and cleaves. The hemoglobin and thyroside survive because it takes after after the hemoglobin, it takes a lot of nutrient from amino acid and it uh, survives. But if you mutate them, you know, if you cleave this part, okay, and then hemoglobin cannot attract and you can see there is no interaction with the, uh, uh, with this arm and hemoglobin cannot go to the active side and because if hemoglobin cannot degrade the hemoglobin, the, you can see very large food vacuole. If you see electron microscopy or even you stain the parasite in simply in Jimsa, you will see the food vacuole is very swollen food vacuole. This is because of undegraded hemoglobin. So that is, and this phenomena inhibits the parasite growth here. And this is, you can check by very simple assay. You incubate the cysteine protease with hemoglobin and see, you know, so you can see here, you know, this is the hemoglobin. And if you incubate that hemoglobin with enzymes, it degrades. And if you mutate, if you remove this enzyme, it cannot degrade the hemoglobin. And even if you mutate some of the residue like valerian globin, it can, it cannot degrade the hemoglobin. So these all, the, this kind of chemistry or biochemistry, how this enzyme interacts with the hemoglobin and how it degrades the hemoglobin, this is we already know. And, and this is now we are, this is a little bit uh, like different than classical, like people are targeting active sites, but we are also targeting allosteric site, which is, quite interesting, you know, if you see as I talk about pro-domain and mature domain, they are, how they are interacting with hydrophobic and salt with, but if you put them in acidic condition, you know, because parasites are synthesized in ribosomal, and then they go to the food vacuum where the acidic environment is there. So this pro-domain is cleave off and you can see the mature domain. So this is the kind of active domain. But if you, you know, if you break some of these interaction here, even if you put it in acidic condition, peptide remain you know, intact, I mean all the pro-domain and mature domain here. So this cannot degrade the hemoglobin. So this is the kind of, so what we did, uh, and then we thought, you know, if, can we, is it possible, like, can we uh, target, you know, this enzyme other than active side? So this is a just, uh, so this is the, we this is our collaborator from Triple I and Jambu, they synthesize some of the compound and we, made, you know, we just imagine, like, can these uh, compound can go, you know, uh, other than active sites. So we can, can we inhibit those enzymes by, by, you know, other than active sites. So this is the, the different compound. And so what we, you know, that this is the, that structural model, you know, when we try with a lot of compounds, so one of the compound, you can see it is not going to the active site here. And even if you can see the green one, it is sitting in, in interface of these two domain, you know, active domain, like pro domain and mature domain. So this is something, you know, we are, not targeting active side, this is, you know, the allosteric side which is away from the active side. So this, uh, and we, because this is definitely it's a new field compared to the active side targeting, but this had an important, you know, if you, yeah, if you try this, this inhibitor, you know, that NN, N1 and N4, you can see the para this uh, parasite is growing very well in DMSO and other, and you can see this is the E64 is, you know, inhibiting the f f uh, this uh, parasite by solid food vacuole, as I said here. And these two compounds have a very similar effect to E64, but if you see here in the, in the you know, right side, it, this is even better than E64. So this allosteric inhibitor has somehow better activity than standard inhibitor. So, but again, we have to see uh, what is, how it's fitting to the active side, sorry, all allosteric side other than active side. This is kind of, again, we can uh, do lot of uh, structural kind of uh, work here and and if you com see this uh, compound in Bergai model definitely you can this is again better than E64 so you can see here you know that this parastemia uh, this is uh, but this and and both n1 and n0 have a better effect than E64 so that that is definitely uh, this compound is slightly better than E64 and so now yeah this so if you, you know, compare both active side as well as allosteric side, there are some advantage, you know, having, like if you see, this is, this region active side is highly conserved. And if you see the allosteric side, they, these are less conserved here and the rigidity is, uh, binding pocket is very rigid and they have a very, you know, uh, flexible binding sites and single conformation adaptation by the ligand and they have, they have the flexibility. And the important point is here you will have a less chance of mutation because all the surface area interface is very big, which is like unlike it with the active side. So it has an advantage, you know, but 
this field has to work, need a lot of work, like how we can design, you know, inhibitor which is, uh, you know, away, which should bind away of the active site. So this is, again, the kind of new field, you know. Now I will move to the another, uh, which is the, our recent story, like why we are using uh, metacascades 2 and 3 as a detective target. If you see, you know, definitely these are from cascades family, but again, I will tell you, they are very different from cascades. Cascades are, you know, human which has a lot of uh, activity like, you know, that this uh, cellular uh, deformation, cellular integrity and all this, and they, these have uh, very, in case of these, there are some similarity in between cascades and, and mid, but if you see the, they are aspartic, they have aspartic uh, proteases here, and this is uh, very different, arthenine and, and this one, and we have found that this, this uh, active side is uh, quite different, because active side has, they are not cysteine, histidine. They have even have a tyrosine, the active side. So they are very different than the human uh, caspases. So that's why we thought, okay, you know, if they are, if we can target them, these uh, will have a less toxicity effect. So these are the reason why we choose uh, this metacaspase. And if you, and then this is the, like when we knock out this enzyme from Bergia, you can see there is, you know, if you knock out by double homologation and you can see there is no protein in the Western blood and even you can confirm by IFA. So, so that is the, and we check, you know, what is, how, if you knock out those uh, uh, enzyme in the, from the parasite, what is the effect, what is kind of phenotypic effect. So we measure some of the stress marker here in case of, you know, when we remove this enzyme from Bergia and you can see here, you know, the, this ROS level is increased in, in case of knockout uh, parasite line. Similarly, you can see calcium level, you know, at calcium level, it's very typical phenomena, you know, if you, if parasite has a very high calcium, so then this, uh, it will overexpress the phospholipase and phospholipase will, if a lot of activities of phospholipase, it will, you know, damage the membrane and again it will calcify the mitochondria. So this is the kind of very typical stress marker if you, if the calcium level is increased in the parasite. And other one is we also check, you know, different, like dead cell is increasing in knockout parasite and, and in case of ATP, it's, uh, ATP level is decreased. You can see in the center and finally, this is, uh, you know, the, this lower the membrane potential here. So this, this, the, like the standard method to check, you know, how these parasites coming in the stress. So these are the different uh, level of uh, marker here. And then we check, you know, this uh, knockout parasite, how this uh, affect the ukinate, deployment of ukinate. And if you see here, you know, these early stage, these ukinate look like, uh, okay, in mid stage also, but in case of later stage, if you see on the corner of this uh, uh, right side, there are very squeezy kind of ukanides. So these uh, ukanides have a, uh, you know, very distinct character which is not developed properly and they have a very small, you know, the small squeezy type of thing and even you can see the load of oocyst by here in the uh, left side, you can see, you know, if you knock out those parasites, the oocyst load is very less in, and you can check very simply by, you know, stain the midgut. Uh, midgut of the mosquito and, and count the, the oocyst and so this is even slightly better you know if you load check the oocyst level uh, by checking uh, you know the, the, the counting them you can see differently very different very low level of uh, oocyst in knockouts line and you can even this is quantitatively you can measure by uh, this uh, real time PCR by you know these are the markers so even so last if you see the last one here uh, this by measuring CSP and this ribosomal RNA, this spurgeon level is very less in, in case of knockout line. So definitely this enzyme has a important role in the parasite life cycle. So this is the, the, the this our studies indicate that. And now, because this is the, we, we know that this enzyme is very important, you know, for parasite. Now we want to screen what is like, can we inhibit this enzyme and see the effect, what is the effect in parasite. So what we did, because we, as I said, this, are from cascades family, but although active side is different and even, and this type of enzyme not present in humans. So what we did, we use a parent molecule of cascade inhibitor, which is, you know, that this phenylalanine fluoromethylketone, and we twist it, sorry. So this is how we modify some of these functional group as well as, you know, that uh, the, this uh, moiety here, and we've synthesized some of these very, uh, uh, I think, yeah, seven, eight compound, and then check those, their activity. And if you see here, uh, 
these we got out of uh, 10 uh, uh, compound we got two compounds are very effective you can see here s1 and s5 are very effective which can inhibit those, uh, this enzyme and even you, uh, the good thing is this enzyme is not inhibiting any human uh, like caspases or, or uh, this uh, uh, even cathepsin and so it's not inhibiting those human enzymes so that means it's very specific to uh, metacaspase and here you can see the IC50 also inhibitory constant also very uh, good uh, in terms of lower micromolar range and uh, so what we did again by you know earlier I talk about knockout one but here we want to see the effect of those uh, inhibitor in parasite so what we see after incubating this SS5 again there is high level of calcium in case of uh, this uh, this uh, SS5 and same you can see the decreased level of ATP in the parasite and definitely mit mitochondrial potential also uh, decrease when you treat those parasites with the with the, these effective compounds. So these are the again, again so that the parasite what we see in knockout mice again we are confirming by you know incubating with inhibitor. So this is the marker and further we check with you know the gametocyte as well as uh, this uh, this uh, total parasitemia like how you can, this uh, ROS level is increasing in case of uh, treated uh, parasite and definitely with gametocyte also they, they, they have a reduced level of gametocyte in case of treated uh, compound. And this is the in, in vivo effect. So if you come, you know, inject those compound in the mice and uh, calculate the parastemia, definitely parastemia goes very down compared to, you know, the untreated and even you can see the level of uh, suppression is very high. Uh, in the left, so if you treat those compounds, and uh, so this is like I talk about you know, the compound which has a micromolar range of inhibition. But we thought, can we you know make it more potent, like in uh, from micromolar to nanomolar? So again, we change some things from those uh, SS5 which we which uh, we, we already synthesized, and so that it has the effect. So now we did what we change some of the uh, you know changing little bit of those compound and see what are the effect of those modified compounds. We call it, you know, this um, uh, C534 or C53, I think, yeah, C. So these, so out of, I think, uh, 23, we got couple of hit, uh, which can inhibit those uh, enzymes. So these molecules, again, what we did, we thought, you know, maybe this can inhibit the human, uh, human enzyme, but here if you see the, Clearly, you know, this uh, this is uh, only inhibiting the metacaspase 2 and the inhibitory constraint is very good uh, and effective and the native enzyme, you can, you know, see how can this enzyme can be inhibited in native enzyme, you know, which is you simply take a, you know, parasite uh, lysate and incubate with those uh, and see the activity. So that means this combined, this, uh, uh, this uh, compound can inhibit native enzyme also. And similarly, we check those uh, effective compounds 5.3.2 and 5.3.3 three in all the rings, ring stage as well as gametocyte stage. So you can see, you know, the normal parasite is growing very good from all the way from uh, uh, zone to another zone for 72 hours. And if you incubate, you can see here, you know, in the right, there is definitely the growth and you cannot see another stage as compared to the zone stage here. And similarly, if you incubate those compounds with the gametocyte, you will see, you know, the gametocyte shape is very squeezed out. Means the, the there is a deformity in the shape. That means these have a, yeah, definitely something doing in the gametocytes. And yeah, we further check, if, you know, incubating with these compound with the, uh, this uh, uh, in the in the uh, this uh, falciparum as well as bergai and count those oocysts. So we definitely see very reduced number of oocysts. And you can even see here in the left, you know, that uh, this, uh, the oocyst the load is very less in case of treated, uh, treated uh, this one mosquito. And even you can check, you know, that parasite infectivity is uh, measured by, you know, this uh, mRNA level. And this is kind of quantitative. So definitely the load is reduced. And uh, so now, yeah, this is. We all talk about this in the culture, but what happens if you treat those, uh, uh, this one uh, compound in the compound to the mice? So if you feed those compound and uh, in the mice and infect them with the burger and see what is the effect of those compounds. 
you can see here, you know, these are non-toxic. So you just simply, you know, throw these compound in the Hep G2 cells and even you incubate those compound with the blood, uh, normal RBC, so they, they, are, it's, they are not toxic to normal cells as well as, as, and, uh, as, well as cell line, human cell line. So what we see here, these, uh, these uh, treated mice, you know, parasite has significantly lower uh, gametocyte load as well as when you talk about, you know, the survival rate, so definitely out of five mice, four mice are live up to 20, 25 days. So, you know, if you treat them, so that is kind of very good effect. You know, if you have, by incubating those uh, compound, you have increased the lifespan of uh, mice. So that means these uh, compound are, have a very good effect on even in in vivo system. And so what I talk about here uh, is first, the, this enzyme is very important. You know, if you knock out those uh, enzymes, so it has a it has lot of, uh, uh, the redox oxidation is level is very high and all these calcium is goes very high and as well as ATP level goes very low. So these kind of all stress. So this is what our all we propose that, you know, how this, uh, this uh, enzyme is uh, uh, causing induced death. So what we did, we simply take a parent molecule, we change them and it shows very good inhibition, but that is on micromolar level. But again, we and but the good thing is it's not inhibiting human cathepsin and caspases so which is specifically targeting to somatic caspase and then these are not to non toxic to human as well as rbc human cell line and again we modified these uh, compound to to uh, some functional group they have a very potent in in nanomolar range so that is uh, even you know we start with the micromolar but we change some of the moiety from those compounds, it now turned out to be nanomolar range. And definitely, you know, how it's killing the parasite by increasing the reactive oxygen species and calcium level increase and definitely decreasing ATP level. So this is kind of all mixing and they are causing, you know, the death of parasite because of induced cell death. So this is the what our, you know, the based on our biochemical and cell biology data that these uh, compound have a induced cell death uh, kind of phenomena in case of parasites. So this is, uh, I think, what I saw here, that is the mechanism of this, uh, uh, of this compound. And finally, so uh, yeah, this is basically all work done by Akamsa, now she's in Harvard, and Vandana, she already joined John Hopkins, and Srini, so who worked earlier in now, he's in Canberra, and most of the people we have we have Professor Rawat, so he gave us very uh, effective compound here, and these, fun, these uh, you know, research is mostly funded by uh, National Research Foundations as well as Indo-Swiss Indo DST and our other collaborator from from uh, uh, from our side, like uh, you know, the Switzerland or other things. So definitely, so I will be happy to take your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Pandey, for nice presentation. Uh, now, how is this open for uh, questions, especially the students? Anybody asking the question will get a chocolate at the end. Uh, no question? So if there is no question, please join me to thank the speaker for his wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Agam P. Singh. Uh, he is currently the staff scientist and uh, head of the Infectious Disease Laboratory at National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi. Previously, he served as an assistant scientist at uh, Department of Pathology, New York uh, University School of Medicine, New York. And he has numerous publications. Professor Singh, please.
कोई नहीं आप एक रिमोट कर देते हो अगर काम नहीं करेगा हाँ काम नहीं करेगा तो आप नेक्स्ट बोलोगे तो आप Thank you, Professor Raut, for giving a, a brief introduction, and thank you to the organizers for for Agamsi. Yeah, Agamsi. Yeah. Thank you to organizers for giving me the opportunity. Uh, to all the members, I know it's a time sleepy time, so I would request everybody to take take uh, take a deep breath so that you are not sleepy. So I'll Let's try to uh, share a few of the data that we have generated in, in the area of drug discovery. And uh, if you like it, uh, you can ask some questions on it. <coughs> Let's stop for here. Okay, so uh, I'm just in the background, the building up National Institute of Immunology Gate, and uh, I'm going to talk about a small pharmacophore, uh, hydroxythylamine. Uh, it's an ongoing journey which we are uh, doing uh, since 2016, and uh, for chemistry part, I am dependent on uh, Priyambada Singh and Dr. Vijay Rathi, bo both from Delhi University. So they are my backbone for uh, of supplying all the compounds. So biology part, all the biology part is uh, we are doing in uh, our lab, and the chemistry part is done at the Delhi University. So reserve your questions to the chemistry part, and may you may ask uh, Brijes and other people for the chemistry part. For biology part, I am here. Whatever you want to ask, you can ask. <coughs> Okay, so brief uh, uh, life cycle uh, of the parasite. Uh, it starts from the first bite of the infec uh, infected mosquito to the host, and then the sporozoite form, which are infective form, they are released under the skin, and from there they travel through blood vessels, reach to the liver, and they infect there. So my lab primarily focuses on the first step, which is called the liver stage of the parasite. It's a silent stage. There is no disease, no symptoms. And in humans, it may last from uh, five to nine days. Uh, the parasite load is very, very low. So it's a very attractive target for both vaccine development as well as for the uh, drug discovery. Although wherever there is an uh, opportunity to explore further, we do uh, grow parasite uh, for the blood stage as well as we have the facility to grow the mosquitoes and infect them. So sometime we complete the cycles, other most of the time we try to restrict ourselves to the liver stage for biology purposes, for studying the biology. So uh, just to give you an idea what is the load looks like uh, in different stages, as you can see uh, the liver stage is the lowest load, it's under 100 uh, parasite which are there. And if you compare that with the asexual, asexual blood stages, they are in like several 10 to 100 billions. So that is the difference uh, in these two stages. And because the sheer number of the blood stages, any drug that you develop, if it is not 100% effective, it will lead to drug re resistance and also that will be transmitted and there is a selection for the drug resistant parasite. So there is advantage uh, working on the liver stage, and, but there are also some disadvantages uh, that infected parasite numbers are very low and it's not easy to uh, trace them or also uh, doing any kind of biochemistry is difficult with them. Okay, so my lab, uh, infectious disease lab at and I, uh, we have three areas where we work, uh, understanding the basic, bi basic biology of the malaria parasites, uh, more specifically liver stages. We also work on anti-malarials, and my lab is also working on antigen discovery and vaccine development. So today I will only talk about the anti-malarials. So why we need 
uh, anti-malarial when we already have uh, several of them. Uh, many speakers have already introduced that the developing, uh, the resistance is developed or developing to majority of the anti-malarial drugs that we have. So there, is, there has to be a constant effort from scientific community to try to find out drugs which are not leading to a, a newer resistance. So our approach is that look for those inhibitors which can inhibit all three stages of the parasite, which is liver stage, blood stage, and the mosquito stage. So we are actually looking for such molecules which are triple stage active and uh, hope that in future when we come up with something which is uh, which can be used in humans, uh, parasite don't develop resistance. But that is only hope. So uh, a simple molecule, hydroxythylamine, uh, as a pharmacophore. Initially it was, uh, the project started like uh, looking for the inhibitors of aspartic proteases. Dr. Kalas already introduced about the proteases. So uh, within the aspartic proteases, more specifically plasmepsins were the, our initial targets. So uh, some of the molecules that we worked, uh, they did inhibit uh, different plasmepsins. But later on we have done a lot of modification and we have come up with the new molecules uh, with a newer mechanism. Uh, some of them we are trying to understand. We know some of them are still, we don't know what are the target, but they are really good molecule, very potent molecules. So uh, in the beginning we started with the HIA uh, moiety and then we, side, the, we changed the side chains and we look for the effective uh, uh, efficacy of these molecules and we found that uh, these molecules were working in the micromolar range and good thing was that they were also active against the artemisinin uh, resistance strain. So as you can see here, these are active against liver stages, blood stage, as well as the mosquito stage. So compound one and two, both were uh, good enough in the one to 10 micromolar uh, range for different stages. Uh, but majority of them were able to give the IC50 in the range of one to two micromolar. Uh, for in vivo study, we did to check in the mice whether in vivo they can uh, kill the liver stages. Uh, we did one dose test for the 50 mg per kg and there were at least uh, a 50% reduction in the load of the liver stage parasite in vivo. So these were the first generation of molecule which were not very active. We are still trying to uh, find out the base and then in future uh, refine and get better molecules. So, but we are just sharing the journey how we moved ahead. So, and this we did a little bit more work to find out the peak plasma concentration of 0.2 microgram per ml at 20 mg per kg dose, which was given subcutaneously. Uh, the drawback of these molecules were there, the retention was low, only four hours. And uh, the putative target for this was pla plasmepsin 2. So this work was uh, published in Royal Society of Chemistry. Then we improved on and then tried to find out a better uh, molecule. So one of the molecule which uh, me and collab my collaborators have named as calexinin, uh, this was a, a better compound than the previous version. And uh, this is again a multi-stage inhibitor. In the bottom, if you see, uh, there are the images which are showing the ukinids on the top which are untreated and the uh, bottom to that there you can see that there are swollen uh, ukinids. You can see balloon-like uh, swollen uh, ukinids in the bottom and the, those are because of the effect of these drugs. So I'm just sharing uh, one of the uh, images just to give you uh, idea that yes, it is uh, multi-stage active and uh, they are inhibiting and doing their job as expected. So, uh, both calixinin and the previous version of the drugs were not, uh, still not good enough for us. So we went on to uh, further modification and instead of taking only one pharmacophore, we combined two pharmacophore, two known pharmacophore here and piprazine. Piprazine is already uh, known anti-malarial pharmacophore. 
So those uh, two were combined and then uh, multiple side chains were added to see uh, the best uh, activity that we can get. And these were synthesized in uh, Bridges' lab. Uh, and then the IC50 and the CC50 values were uh, tested uh, in my lab. And what I would like to draw your attention is that the four of the molecules, uh, 5C, 5D, and then uh, uh, 5L and M, 5M, four of them were having the therapeutic index of more than 1,000. So practically they are non-toxic. So you can use uh, even higher dose as, as much as you want to use them, but fortunately, uh, we don't uh, need that, that much of compound because they are working in the nanomolar range. And this work, I'm just giving a, one brief idea. Uh, this was already published in Journal of Medicinal Chemistry. So, so these uh, molecules are active against the plasmodium falciparum 3D7 at 150 uh, nanomole uh, scale, IC50, against the uh, resistant strain of the plasmodium at 110 uh, nanomolar. The activity against the liver stage was 1.5 micromolar and therapeutic index was 1560. And in the blood stage assay as well as, well as in the survival mouse survival assay, uh, you can see on the left hand side bottom that the compounds are quite active and the mouse survived quite long after treatment uh, the infected mice were surviving longer uh, after the treatment. So here I am giving a one glimpse, uh, glimpse of that how good these compound are. On the left hand side in the green you see those parasites infecting the mosquito uh, midgut. On the right side those are the mosquito which were uh, fed with the uh, treated mouse and you can see the uh, clear cut indication that how good these molecules are. How we hardly saw one or two oocysts in the mosquito which were fed on the treated m mice. So it's very potent for the mosquito stage, potent for the liver stage, as well as uh, potent for the blood stages. So uh, some of these molecules we are planning to take uh, to test them in uh, non-human primates and hopefully uh, this sometime this year we will be able to uh, do that and if it everything works fine, probably we'll go to the phase one trial. So uh, still we are in the search of newer molecules uh, to see if we can still uh, do better than what we already have. So a new series of compounds were synthesized. And so right now I'm sharing the data with the only for the six molecules that we have recently tested. So bottom two, LTC 1088 uh, and 1089, they have the fluorine molecule for uh, better hyd hydrophobic interaction and uh, for more hydro uh, lipophilicity and for retention in the body. So the toxicity was done. Some of them are toxic, so, um, but some of them are not so toxic, so they can be taken further. On a RBC hemolytic assay up to 10 micromolar, there was negligible RBC lysis. So at least up to 10 micromolar, we can use them without any problem. And here I'm showing the uh, stage specific uh, inhibition of the parasites using these compounds. And uh, on the left hand side, you see this uh, LTCA 1084, 85 and 89. The majority of the parasite, they are stuck at the trough stage. In the blue dot that you are seeing, they are mostly troughs. So they are not able to go beyond the trophozoite stage of the blood stage parasite. Uh, normally they go, grow from trophozoite to cygent and next cycle initiate, but these parasite after treatment, they are not able to cross the trophozoite stage. The other compounds, 86, 87, 89, they are also effective, uh, but uh, the, the level of inhibition for 
trophogyte stage was less compared to the uh, left three molecules. And there the ring stage parasites were more uh, in those uh, cultures. That means there uh, some of the parasites were able to mature and go grow into cygons and give rise to the new infection which is merozoid. So that is why on the right hand side three molecules they were giving more in new infection but on the left hand side molecules they were not uh, able to go into the next cycle. So here I am showing the uh, IC50 curves for these molecules and they are as you can see they are working in the lower micromolar uh, range. Uh, they are IC50s and then uh, parasite uh, IC inhibition assay, the time dependent uh, inhibition of these uh, parasites were tested and uh, majority of them are inhibiting at the late, late stage of the growth. As you can see majority of them are active between 36 and 48 hours. So late stage inhibitors of the parasite growth and they are not allowing the parasite to go beyond the 48 uh, sorry, tropozoite stage. So these are some of the publication, just the indicative publication which came uh, based on the hydroxythylamine based compound. We have much more uh, publication, but these were some of them. And we have got two patents, uh, one US patent already granted and two patents are pending, Indian patents are pending based on these molecules. Thanks to all my collaborators, the people who have contributed and uh, last but not least, the money which is coming from DVT, uh, NSERB, and i -Core grants, ICMR, and BIREC NBM. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prashant Singh, for your stimulating talk. Now, house is open for question. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. So, what are the targets? Because it's a multi-stage inhibitor, right? Right. So they must have some targets. And so, so in, have you checked any of the targets so far? In case of uh, the initial versions of HIA that we uh, made, they were targeting plasmepsins. The molecule that we have labeled as calixinin, it is uh, inhibiting the uh, calcium transport. So it's inhibiting the calcium transporter. This, the series of uh, 5C and 5D that uh, we discussed, which was uh, showing very good activity, that we still don't know. We are still working on that. We have done the uh, uh, selection of the parasites um, for one month under drug pressure, did the genomics and proteomics. It, things are uh, still under analysis. So hopefully, maybe in next six months or so, we will be able to identify the correct uh, target and validate that. So, because they are multi-stage inhibitors, so in right. the other stage, do you find any new target or it's always, for example, no, the I, th I think the target will remain same. Okay. It's not going to fl uh, fluctuate the target, but the only issue that we see that, that whether they are specific to only one target or there is a more than one target, yeah. because our the initial analysis, proteomic analysis, is indicating that there is a more than one uh, it's target. a small molecule, so there are Yeah, so there is a more than one target is expected uh, for these molecules. Okay. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Yeah, any more questions? Yeah, please. Nice work. So, uh, we checked, we checked uh, those. Hello. So, you checked those, uh, uh, you know, compound up to Ushis level, right? Yeah. So, what if you go beyond Ushis, like. No sporozoid. Zero. Zero sporozoid. You can see one or two oocysts, but zero sporozoid. <coughs> not even in hemolymph, not even in salivary gland. So complete inhibition. Yeah. Anybody else? So if there is no more question, let me please thank uh, Dr. Singh for his wonderful presentation. Uh, next speaker of the session is Dr. Anand Bhatt. Dr. Bhatt is a senior scientist at DRDO, Institute of Nuclear Medicine and Allied Sciences, New Delhi. He has played a pivotal role during the COVID pandemic, actually. He developed a molecule that was very useful for uh, dealing with the COVID that is called 
2 dg dr bhat has been honored with prestigious award including european molecular biology organization fellowship and fulbright fellowship forum is yours professor bhat Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Rawat. Uh, and thanks to the organizers who gave me this opportunity to present my work here on this platform. Uh, actually, uh, since yesterday we are uh, hearing a lot about infectious diseases, various different kind of infectious diseases, uh, viral as well as malaria predominantly. So now this, uh, uh, I am not going to talk about infectious disease. This is basically a drug development work, mainly for a problem which is uh, related to I mean, the problem itself is infectious, like uh, now for more and more energy requirement, we need more and more nuclear plants. Uh, more than that, uh, you know, like uh, all the uh, countries nearby us, they want to become uh, nuclear capable. So these things uh, basically lead to, uh, to the problem, which is uh, mm, uh, exposure to ionizing radiation. So that is one of the major problem uh, if uh, suppose that somebody gets exposed to the radiation. So what, uh, what are the different kind of sources which may lead to the exposure of radiation? So you can see here that like uh, medical imaging is one thing, then uh, uh, any kind of accidents or space explorations. So when people go, uh, astronauts goes, goes to the space, they also get exposed to uh, ionizing radiation and which leads to different kind of problems in astronauts. So uh, other than that, the terrorist attack is another thing then uh, uh, strategic explosions as well as uh, fallout after the explosion which happens. So uh, these are the problems or uranium mining is another thing like we know uh, that we, uh, our Kerala region which is having lot of thorium, uh, there also people get exposed to radiation and then uh, the basal level of radiation is much higher as compared to rest of the country. So uh, th uh, on earth there are different kind of places like this which have relatively higher uh, level of radiation as compared to uh, normal basal level. So uh, if the person gets uh, exposed to this kind of radiation, you, uh, you, can, uh, you can see here that uh, it can be of two different kind like if the radiation source is kept somewhere else like X-ray radiation or gamma radiation like that and if it is uh, kept at a distance the radiation. So then the uh, person will get exposed from, uh, from a distance. Uh, that time people will not even realize and they will have damage, molecular damage inside the body and that will lead to uh, morbidity sometimes and if the exposure level is high then probably death also. But what happens like in nuclear explosion and uh, the nuclear accidents kind of uh, scenario, these radioactive particles they get, exp uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean exploded and uh, uh, these two different places in the environment. So either they will go in our body, they will settle down on our body parts or they may inhaled uh, in the lung or they may be ingested through food, uh, food items. So in all these scenarios what will happen, they will be either on the uh, different parts of our body or they will be ingested and they will be irradiating because you know many of these, uh, they have very long half-life also like strontium and all they will very easily go and uh, go to our bones and they will keep irradiating uh, our uh, internal uh, cells uh, from there. So that is, that is a big, big problem. So what basically happens, I mean little bit to brief background that what basically happens in this kind of scenario. You can see that there are two different kind of effects of ionizing radiation. One is direct, direct effect, 
So in direct effect, what happens? Like the energy itself, it goes to the macromolecules and it damages the macromolecule, it cleaves the macromolecules and that leads to double strand break and all in the DNA. Then indirect effect is what? It basically because we know 80 to 90, uh, 75 to 80% of our body, uh, we, ha we all have water and that water gets hydrolyzed. So it's called ionizing radiation induced uh, radiolysis and that leads to reactive oxygen species formation. So that is a indirect effect. So these uh, ROS, they will, will basically go and they will uh, oxidize all the macromolecules and because of that, uh, the cell death happens. So basically all the lipid and proteins, they will have a lot of ox uh, oxidative damage and because of that, the death will, uh, cell death will happen and ultimately it will lead to different parts. So uh, if a cell gets exposed, uh, I was talking about the whole body exposure. Now if you are talking about at molecular at cellular level, if cell gets uh, exposed, the lipid membrane is one of the major target. Proteins are, which are different enzymes, they are major target and then DNA also. And once DNA gets damaged, you know, I mean, people may carry these kind of mutations for several generations. You must have heard like after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, many generations were, uh, uh, be, I mean, born with deformities, different kind of deformities. So that kind of problem may happen. So what basically happens at uh, when the radiation exposure uh, is given at cellular level, then uh, from cell death, it, it goes to tissue level and from tissue to org organism level and even if the exposure happens once, this, this wave gets disturbed, oxidative stress and this waves and inflammation wave uh, is formed and it is continuously increasing. Even if you are not getting secondary exposure, then also this, uh, this, exposure, uh, this uh, wave is bas basically continuously going up and up and the person dies predominantly because of this reason. So what happens, you can see uh, at low doses what, we, what is happening, late effects will come like cancer and cataract or lung fibrosis, that kind of problem. But at higher doses, hematopoietic syndrome, GI syndrome, uh, central nervous uh, uh, system syndrome and, and molecular death. Sometimes the, if the radiation dose exposure is very high, people will not realize and then they will die within few hours itself. So that is called molecular death. But in, in case of hematopoietic syndrome and GI syndrome, it may go on to five, like four or five days or maybe weeks time. So this is, this is the basically problem. So uh, what basically happens, you, uh, you all may be knowing that radiation is being used not only for imaging, for therapy also we are using it. And why we are using it in therapy? Why? Because this concept that cancer cells proliferate very fast. And any cell which is proliferating very fast, they are very sensitive to radiation. And the same concept is be, uh, uh, the same, I mean that is the concept being, uh, behind using radiation as a radiotherapy in uh, cancer patients. So you can see here like if some, uh, like if soldier is going, I mean uh, being a defense, uh, why we are working because in this kind of scenarios, uh, the quick response teams or soldiers will be basically going to this kind of places where to, to do the rescue operations. So uh, you can see here that if soldier is going there, so in our body there are certain type of cells which are very fast proliferating and what are those cells? They are blood cells and our gut cells also. So they are continuously being replaced, they proliferate very fast. So uh, what is basically happening, you can see here at very low doses like 1 gray, 2 gray, uh, the person's uh, bone marrow uh, cells will be completely gone, the stem cells also and proliferating cells also. And you can see here the WBCs counts going down as down in the day one itself. So the number goes suddenly down. And uh, once uh, at little higher doses, our gut, uh, which is relatively more resistant, what happens like the gut damage happens. And you can see here that these are the normal crypts, these are normal villi in the uh, in our uh, duodenum and jejunum and you can see here after radiation exposure that uh, this all the villi are gone completely. So because of WBC are completely gone, so the person has lost their immune system and uh, ability to fight with the infection, any kind of infection and you know like our gut is full of lot of microbiome, right? So and the gut also got damaged, so what will happen? that the microbes will percolate in our blood stream and we don't have immune system to fight with those uh, microbes. So what will happen? This kind of uh, person will develop sepsis and eventually the mortality. So this is the basic problem and before even that, what is happening like lot of cells, cell damage is happening and all those debris of the cellular damage 
it is coming to the blood stream and leading to inflammation and major inflammation problem is basically happening in this case. So how to achieve radio resistant, uh, resistance in the organism like human to protect so that we can protect them from the radiation. So there are a lot of, I mean, uh, research is being done. So uh, one thing is to learn from the radio resistant organism. Like as I said, like five, five to seven gray is somewhat called LD100 for humans. If the human gets exposed to five to seven gray, they will die. Uh, and insects, they die on five, uh, seven or even 10 kilo gray. So they are thousand times more resistant than us. So why not to learn from insects? Like similarly, the bacteria also, some of the bacteria, they are also very resistant. Uh, similarly, like more than thousand times more resistant than humans. So we can learn from them and then, uh, I mean, do that, that kind of modification in our body so, so that we can, uh, we can, I mean, uh, we can also become resistant. That is one concept. But you know, like uh, bacteria are unicellular organism, then uh, insects are multicellular organism, but they have less complexity. Humans are much more complex and it is very difficult to uh, understand all those mechanisms and uh, apply into the human beings. So the, uh, the other uh, which is very uh, close to us is the cancer cells. You know, as I, as I, know, uh, as I told that uh, uh, radiation is being used in case of cancer as a radiotherapy. So cancer cells also become very resistant to radiation and uh, the therapy, bec uh, they become resistant to therapy as well. So that is also one of the homologous cells. Our own cells, they become resistant to radiation. We can learn from them and then apply those mechanisms to uh, to do the therapy, uh, to, uh, to uh, become resistant. So uh, there are many, uh, I mean, the literature is full of uh, the why the cancer cells become resistant to radi uh, radiation. And one of those mechanism is the induced glycolysis or induced energy metabolism in, uh, in, in cancer cells. You can see here the, all the hallmark of uh, cancer, uh, out of which the uh, energy metabolism is also one of the key. And uh, we have done a lot of research since long time uh, we, we found that if you increase the glycolysis, the damage, repair of the DNA damage, the repair of the cell is much faster. So increase, and they have, all the cancer cells, they have increased glycolysis, which is called Warburg effect. So it, it forms a basis. So wa what Warburg said, that uh, cancer is mainly happening because of the aerobic glycolysis. I mean, generally, uh, glycolysis happens when the oxygen is not available. But in cancer cells, what happens, the epigenetic modification and mutations happens. They make them to do the aerobic glycolysis and that is called the Warburg effect. So, uh, I mean, this is, this is summarizing Warburg effect that uh, the other problem is like cancer has tumor heterogeneity and uh, oxygen reach, reaching to the every cell of the uh, cancer is also li becoming little difficult. So uh, there is hypoxia as well as there is deprivation of the nutrition also. Because of that, they rely more and more on uh, the glucose uh, metabolism. So uh, this is uh, a classical example has taken by uh, some, of the, some of the people who followed Warburg hypothesis and they showed MCF7 and MDMB. These are the two breast cancer cell models. The MCF7, which has low glycolysis, the, it has less invasiveness and less, uh, less resistant to radiation. However, the MDMB, which, which is highly glycolytic, it has much more uh, invasiveness and much more resistance to radiation. So in the similar, similar cellular models, they have demonstrated that tumor aggressiveness is directly uh, and invasiveness is directly proportional to glucose metabolism. So this is a sufficient, uh, uh, I mean, uh, background that probably uh, if we increase the energy metabolism, predominantly glycolysis, which Warburg proposed long back in 1930, and he got Nobel Prize for that also, that probably uh, the, the resistance is coming from increased glycolysis and survival in cancer cells also is coming because of the increased glycolysis. Now, if you go to the back to the, I mean, our studies literature, we know that the glycolysis is a very less economic. It just gives two ATP. So why in that scenario, I mean, the cancer cells are choosing glycolysis? Uh, I, I'll give you example when we are running, like, you know, adrenaline gets secreted, uh, 3F hormone, which we call fi fight, flight, and fright, which is an emergency situation. So in all the emergency situation, you just analyze what basically happens, our mitochondria gets shut down. Adrenaline, which is a 3F hormone, it nitrosylates mitochondrial proteins, mitochondrial 
activity goes down and the cell immediately switches predominantly to glycolytic metabolism. So even if it is a not a economic, uh, economically viable uh, uh, pathway, it is much more efficient pathway because the production of ATP is much more rapid and that is why uh, this kind of situations, the emergency situations, they switch uh, in metabolism and they uh, become uh, more, in, uh, they, they switch to glycolysis for faster production of ATP because to fight in that situation, you need a very quick ATP production. You, you, I mean people don't bother that how much, how many molecules of glucose I am spending. And uh, you know like uh, the, this, this is very nicely demonstrated like in inflammation also, the monocyte which gets converted to macrophage, there are two different phenotype of macrophage, M1 macrophage and M2 macrophage. So M1 macrophage which is inflammatory and which does all the phagocytosis, they are predominantly glycolytic. Uh, but the same macrophage can get converted to M2 macrophage which is having a balanced uh, metabolism. So that means physiologically in our body switching the metabolism is very well conserved in our evolution and it is possible, it is achievable. And uh, Louis Sokoloff uh, got another Nobel Prize for the same phenomena you can see here. Uh, basically you must be knowing like all the cancer patients, they go to FDG scan. And in FDG scan, if you see here, the, all this black uh, thing, is, it is basically FDG, flor fluorinated uh, deoxyglucose. And this doesn't uh, metabolize. So that is why if FDG is given, all these things are showing the uh, tumors basically. In the, in the, I mean, if you give FDG and just scan the patient through uh, PET, PET camera, you will see that where are the tumor located in your body. So you can see here that uh, uh, FDG, first thing is to uh, locate for the imaging it is, uh, it is being used as well as to <coughs> monitor the prognosis also. You can see here after, after the uh, therapy, the patient's tumor are almost gone. So to monitor the prognosis also it is being used. So the same, pheno uh, same phenomena uh, Louis Sokoloff used and he designed FDG as a one of the tracer and then he also got Nobel Prize for that. So and uh, so now till now we, we, we discussed about that the glycolysis is very important. But later I mean this was proposed by uh, uh, Warburg in 1930s. Much later what happened that uh, more and more research has gone in in cancer biology and they realized that uh, it is not only glycolysis you need because tumor has a very heterogeneous mass. Some, some part is very well oxygenated, some part is not oxygenated and the tumor have diff very uh, uh, heterogeneous mass and that is why therapies are also being failed. So people have seen that it is not only the mitochondrial, uh, uh, sorry uh, the glycolytic metabolism, mitochondrial metabolism oxidative phosphorylation is also very important and we have demonstrated that uh, the dual state hyper energy metabolism is basically uh, important for, uh, for uh, the hyper, uh, I mean uh, hyper growth of the tumors and you can see here that uh, when we modified the cells and we injected in animals it forms a small tumor but if uh, the cells with high uh, glycolysis and high uh, oxidative phosphorylation they form much, uh, they form much bigger tumors. So this is, this is now, I mean in literature also it is mu much established that not only glycolysis probably a good uh, 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 mitochondrial energy metabolism is also equally important because mitochondria determines the survival of the cell also. So mitochondria in good condition is also essentially required. So this we have shown that uh, if we transiently elevate glycolysis, uh, the cells uh, can become resistant to radiation. You can see here as compared to control uh, radiation, uh, the uh, treated cells, they become more resistant in three different cellular models. And you can see here that the, um, the glycolysis uh, also has gone up and uh, uh, the glucose consumption and uh, uh, lactate production has also gone up and if you inhibit the glycolysis, they become more sensitive. I mean this, you can see here that the uh, resistance has gone up but if you inhibit the glycolysis, they become sensitive. So that means the predominantly their resistance, the DNP or oxidative phosphorylation modified thing is coming mainly because of the glycolysis. Uh, then uh, as I said like uh, then we did mild, uh, uh, we started using some of the uh, this um, uh, metabolism modifiers to analyze whether they can make the cells resistant 
and they can give radio protection in uh, organism model. So you can see here that uh, when we did uh, when we did mild mitochondrial uncoupling, we found that uh, these my, uh, mitochondrial uncouplers they make the cells uh, the the delta psi m. You can see that it is much less as compared to the control. Uh, the mild this is called the mild uncoupling, not the not the significant uncoupling. And at these concentration where mild uncoupling is happening, the the uh, one can observe the the resistance is coming and uh, the glycolysis is going up, uh, all, many of the markers going up and then, uh, uh, sorry, the mitochondrial uh, oxygen consumption rate goes up and here you can see the glycolytic energy metabolism, the glucose, uh, the glucose consumption and lactate production also goes up and then many of the, uh, uh, the glucose transporters and met uh, glucose metabolizing enzymes of glycolysis, they all, uh, the in uh, expression of all these uh, enzymes also goes much higher. And uh, so, so uh, we demonstrated that this uh, mild mitochondrial uncoupling is making this protecting the cells from radiation. And you can see here, these are the control, all the, all this uh, uh, orange dot which you are se is seeing, they are the mitochondria with uh, good or high uh, membrane potential and all the green thing which you are seeing they are basically low uh, uh, mitochondrial membrane potential. So you can see here that when you are doing mild uncoupling there is, uh, there is mild uncoupling is happening but if you at larger concentration high mitochondrial uncoupling is happening and these mild mitochondrial uncoupling is able to protect, we have uh, demonstrated uh, using various mitochondrial uncouplers BAM15, DNP, FCCP and uh, uh, TH uh, BHT, all the four, they made uh, the cells much more uh, resistant to radiation. And this is a clonogenic survival, uh, the demonstration that uh, using dinitrophenol and uh, DMF is called dose modification factor. So anything which is showing more than 1.2 dose modification factor is considered to be a, I mean proposed to be a good, uh, can be translated as a good radio predictor. And raw is one of the very sensitive monocytic cell line, hematopoietic cell line. And you can see we are getting 1.2 here also, but in other cell lines we are get, getting much more than 1.2, like 1.44 and 1.5 uh, dose modification factor. Uh, this uh, this mitochondrial uncoupling, see, the people initially people uh, used, uh, I mean, uh, because as I said, uh, the ROS is one of, oxidative stress is one of the big, biggest problem. Inflammation is one of the biggest problem after radiation exposure. So people used anti-inflammatory as well as antioxidant also. But when they used antioxidant, they didn't, uh, became, they could not good success, success in that, in designing a radio protector. When they used anti-inflammatory also, they could not design the good uh, I mean uh, radio protector. So in that that means the, uh, the molecular events which are happening at cellular level, uh, understanding that and modulating them is very important. So uh, you can see here the redox regulation very well. After radiation exposure, this is up to uh, 48 hour we have followed and you can see that red one is uh, coming from a radiation. Whereas when D these are DNP treated, the reactive oxygen species primary burst and secondary burst both is much less here and uh, this is very well uh, can be seen in both total ROS as well as mitochondrial ROS and the macromolecular damage is also much less as compared to uh, oxidative stress induced macromolecular damage is also much less. This is about DNA damage you can see here that the ATP level C basically all the DNA damage processing is very well ATP dependent and kinase dependent. So you can see here these, these uh, green dots are basically every dot is representing the double strand break, DNA damage there. And you can see here that the damages uh, in, in radiation alone is much higher at 4 hour uh, after radiation exposure as compared to DNP treated, uh, treated cells. And uh, the removal of the damage is also much faster. And this is very well linked with the increased uh, uh, ATP production as well as uh, the, uh, the mitochondrial biogenesis. So mitochondria is multiplying because of their uh, mitochondrial uncoupling. They are produ producing more, uh, I mean, uh, ATP, uh, more ATP is coming from glycolysis as well as mitochondrial contribution both. And uh, you can see here, they, uh, we stained this, uh, these cells with A23187 and this represents the, uh, all these blue, blue dots, they represent the mitochondrial damage. And you can see like after DNP treatment, 
these mitochondrial damages has also gone significantly down and mitochondrial calcium also which uh, uh, sir was talking about that the mitochondria they become calcified because because uh, because of this oxidative stress lot of calcium release and mitochondria is the immediate buffer they take all the mito calcium and they buffer that and they they themselves get fragmented so that's how they save the cells so that the cell can survive so dnp induces mitochondrial biogenesis so there is more number of mitochondria to take up these enhanced calcium imbalance and they are able to protect the cells from radiation induced damage you can see that much less number of damaged mitochondria can be seen here so uh, in fact when you uh, treat uh, i mean oxidative stress alone is not able to give that kind of protection he, here you can see we use mitotempo which directly goes to the mitochondria and give oxidative stress protection to the mitochondria so uh, mitotempo is not able to protect that much amount of dna damage what mitotempo plus dnp is able to do so th that is why we s pr propose that so, okay so so that is why we propose that probably my, uh, mitotempo and then uh, i mean uh, oxidative stress and calcium regulation both is able to protect much better uh, in much better condition so the summary from this part is uh, both enhanced aerobic glycolysis and mitochondrial respiration is required for uh, protecting the cells from radiation induced damage and why it is it is important because hypermetabolism provides rapid energy production regulation of redox balance and calcium homeostasis efficient macromolecular damage recognition and repair and pro survival signaling modulation so these factors are basically coming from uh, the enhanced energy metabolism and that is what uh, giving the protection so we then validated this concept of the in vitro concept into in vivo models and we uh, took this dnp but it is not giving that much amount of protection which probably we wanted that at 50 percent uh, lethal uh, uh, dose it is giving only just 20 percent more uh, 30 percent more uh, advantage the similar thing we observed with another p10 inhibitor that BBP, BPV hovic a, a molecule which inhibits p10 and induces glycolysis with that also we got much less protection with il6 interleukin 6 which is a cytokine that is known to induce the metabolism and that is giving one of the best protection which we uh, which we were expecting but multi uh, uh, at multiple doses so we worked out the mechanism of il6 again uh, i mean these are various literature evidence that il6 is uh, i mean uh, it, it it can be a good protective and ischemic reperfusion injury which is again similar to radiation injury uh, they both are able to give the better protection in that kind of scenario uh, this is again and when we run basically il6 production go very high in our body and uh, and that is very important people have demonstrated that to put uh, the il6 knockout mice when they put on exercise they de uh, they developed uh, the cardiac uh, ischemic reperfusion injury so il6 is very important to protect our uh, cardiac uh, cardiac muscles when we are running or doing extraneous exercise so that is very important and uh, this is also physiologically achievable so we worked out all the mechanism of il6 how it is protecting basically by activating akt signaling and statatory uh, signaling and if you inhibit that the radio protection uh, radio resistance can be gone and we published this data also <coughs> so we injected il6 in mice and you can see here that il6 level is going in uh, my going high in uh, um, uh, mice uh, from serum and it is able to from various organs we saw that it is able to do stat free phosphorylation and uh, after that when we uh, when we ex uh, 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 i mean uh, checked the bone marrow density you can see here that in radiation the bone marrow red thing is like blue uh, this blue is basically uh, the cells i mean proliferating cells but you can see that the, the cells are completely gone from the radiation but in il6 plus radiation there are a lot good amount of cells are preserved uh, so uh, so it is giving good hematopoietic protection and a spleen and a spleen uh, other parameters also showing that that it is giving good protection uh, in gut also you can see here at 9 gray the gut uh, villi are completely gone but in il6 plus radiation there are very well pres preserved villi you can see and uh, all the green is basically showing the brdo staining that means the more and more proliferation is also happening il6 is known for this and when we inhibited the uh, the uh, il6 signaling using gsi124 which is an inhibitor of statatory phosphorylation you can see that whatever protection we were getting this green color line is abrogated so it is basically acting through statatory phosphorylation inducing metabolism and then protecting the cells from radiation so this is the overall summary of this work 
and which we worked out in the small animal uh, C57 mice. This work is uh, given to CDRI for some regulatory studies probably after that we will be able to take it up into NHP uh, model. And these are the uh, basically students who worked in this. Yogesh uh, did all the DNP work, Neeraj did all the IL-6 related work and uh, Ankit and Dhananjay they have done this uh, P10 AKT work. So uh, these are the students who, who uh, I mean since last one decade uh, we were able to do this, uh, this mammoth work on several molecules for radio protection and the funding from DRDO. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you Dr. Burt uh, for a wonderful thought provoking uh, talk and the house is open for quick questions. The students. question to push Yes, yes, please. Sir, it was a really nice presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Sir, my question is that you described method to prevent cells from dying from uh, radiation, right? So how can we expect this uh, method would be put into the use? Like if the research work will be actually put into the use. So are you expecting this time soon or maybe later in the future? Uh, that's what I told in the end that uh, we have completed the anim uh, small animal trial. We are trying, I mean the trial is uh, under process in NHP. So once it is done, this IL-6 which I told you that the, the body's own molecule, human own IL-6 molecule. So if we are injecting that in human, that is not going to create a problem. So we are giving, going to give it before radiation exposure so that it can, it will give a mild pro-inflammation making the person ready for having a bigger inflammation which is going to come. So it is a prophylactic approach like the same thing which you do in vaccine. So basically it's just a simple injection you can put before going into right. such situation. Right. right. Thank you sir. Injection. Good yeah. question. Very good. Anybody else? No? So if there is no question please join me to thank uh, Dr. Bhatt for his wonderful presentation. So the uh, last presentation of this session is uh, by Professor Ajit Jaiswal. Professor Jaiswal is a professor in the Department of Anthropology at uh, Dr. Harishing Gaur Vishwavidyalaya Central University Sagar. He has published 11 books and more than 100 papers and he serves on the editorial board and of many journals and reviewer of the numerous journals. Uh, Professor Jaiswal please. Thank you very much, Professor Rava, sir. Today I'm going to discuss about something very different and uh, the thing that we discussed up till now, this is somewhat different and uh, probably this is uh, another criteria that need to be analyzed and discussed over here. Uh, we, uh, today I'm going to discuss about a topic called public health and indigenous knowledge of healing among the tribes of India. So the two broad dimension, one is dealing with public health, other is dealing with indigenous knowledge of healing that I'm go going to discuss over here. So uh, when we start discussing about public health, uh, better we call it as uh, understanding the critical role of public health in society. Uh, in the vast landscape of uh, mankind, or we can, case, we can say that healthcare, there is one stand strong pillar that is quite tall, guiding communities towards optimum well-being and resilience that is uh, public health. It is rooted in the principle of prevention rather than cure. Public health encompasses a broad array of initiatives, policies and practices aimed at safeguarding and improving the health of population. It is a field of, that touches every aspect of our life, uh, from the air we breathe to the food we eat and the neighborhood we inhabit. As we navigate through the complexities of modern living, the significance of public health becoming increasingly 
apparent at its core public health is about promoting and preventing the collective welfare of community its scope encompasses a wide range of endeavors including disease surveillance health promotion environment health health education policy advocacy and emergency emergency preparedness the poet the proactive approach not only save the lives but also reduce the burden on the healthcare systems and minimize the economic cost associated with uh, treating preventable diseases so public health professionals they strive to empower individual and uh, communities to make healthier and uh, adopt lifestyle conducive to 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 long term wellness now when we discuss about the another feature another part of our my lecture that is indigenous knowledge which we call it as a treasure for society or treasure for humanities indigenous knowledge embodied a holistic understanding of the interconnectedness between human nature and the spiritual realm it reflect an intimate relationship with the environment where each plant each animal and landscape hold significant significance beyond its uh, physical attributes so this world view often emphasize harmony balance and reciprocity advocating the 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 advocating for responsible warden of the earth for the benefit of present and future generation at the core of indigenous knowledge are oral traditions passed down through either through storytelling or through ceremonies and rituals this narrative serve as vessel for transmitting cultural value historical account and practical insight into survival and flexibility in challenging environment this may be through songs dance rituals indigenous community preserve their identities and reinforce bond bonds with the land fostering a sense of belongings and interconnectedness now when we try to understand the indigenous wisdom which i call it as a as the healing power of a traditional knowledge so in the heart of indigenous culture lies a profound understanding of healing that transcends the boundaries of conventional medicine rooted in centuries of traditions rituals and connected to the natural world indigenous knowledge of healing offer a holistic approach that addresses not only the physical body but also the mind spirit and community the indigenous approach to healing is one such example of indigenous knowledge and it is discussed as a kind of knowledge system which consists of a set of common value belief world view experience and practice it it comprises lived exper experiential and enacted knowledge and its determinants are minds body spirit ecology and socio cultural practices indigenous approach to healing is continued uh, constituted locally and embedded in the practice institutions relations and rituals a like other form of indigenous knowledge indigenous approach to healing is also essential unspoken and practiced orally through this this through uh, though there are some unique and universal feature of indigenous approach to healing like use of trance knowledge obtained during an altered state of consciousness belief in spirit and supernatural world and healing in divination it prohibits indigenous approach to healing to comply with the basis and framework of the imperialist empiricist model therefore there are there has been always a general disagreement regarding the placement of indigenous approach to healing what we call it as iah within the domain of knowledge system and religion the practitioners of the empiricist model and non traditional healer in uh, in anthropological categorizations professional healing he, healing practitioners they categorize indigenous approach of healing as a animistic form of religion rather than a knowledge system unfortunately most of the writing on iih were also puzzled by the misconception and false labeling of iih by empiricist framework and set the notion rolling for validating of validating ias through the western scientific or the empiricist framework in the process of validation ih scholars have consciously or unconsciously kept a distance from the metaphysics of indigenous knowledge and only focused on the material used in indigenous healing for example the existing writing on ias mostly dealt with the scientific investigation of extensively diverse but insufficiently documented knowledge of 
ethno-medicinal plant, geological secondary compound, minerals and other physical substances. It's scarcely this kind of studies involved in the philosophical inquiry of indigenous knowledge of healing. The obvious reason that seems accountable to choose material over epistemology and metaphysics of IH could be the, the contested notion of healing, changing concept of health or disease, the inclusion of supernatural agent, use of rituals in healing, diversity of worldview and belief system in the inquiry of health. The other intention that appear logical for excluding metaphysics as source or data that is, that is at odds with the materialist and empiricist framework. Therefore, the exclusion of metaphysical data that, that question the sustainability of a model appears an easier way rather than to include those and involve in deep inquiry and change the assumption involved in modeling. At the same time, another crit criticism that IH often encountered is the non-replicability of process. A good response to this criticism comes from the debate of subjectivity and historical continuity of the tradition that addresses the flaws in the, in the criticism. But before that, there are few important questions that are needed to be answered in context of the present article concern. Is there an indigenous approach to health and disease? Is there any philosophical concept of indigenous healing? In this article, the above question mentioned, mentioned question will be analyzed with the help of a case study of a selected indigenous tribal community of Kerala and Asham. In due course, the researcher will also try to discuss different model of indigenous approach of healing and how the model of IAH is different from other existing model of health and healing. So what is the purpose of healing? That is another important point that we want to discuss over here. As discussed above, there is no single definition of healing. However, etymologically, healing comes from, a, from a term called hilom, meaning wholeness. But again, wholeness in what sense? Is it a process or an experience? Is it, is it, a, is it functional or desired? Is it an act of trans, transcendence or transformation? Each discipline of knowledge uh, define healing differently. Therefore, the concept remains confusing and inexact. The Western, the, the Western healthcare discipline inspired by naturalist view describe healing in functional term as an activity of the profession of medicine. However, the prominent or proponent of holistic view define it in, in experimental terms, transcending suffering and transforming it into holiness. It is, it is, it is, if it is so, can there be a single definition of healing? Is there any philosophy of healing? Will an operational definition of healing serve the explanation of mechanism? To answer this question, it is important to analyze the various characteristics which are connected to the concept of healing. Healing in, in medicine has been described as a restoration of health from, the, from an unbalanced diseased, damaged or unvitalized organism. According to this definition, healing is a relative term and can be understood from bodily or biological term. Whereas Raymond Firth and et al. has defined four attributes of healing after performing concept analysis and extensive literature review on healing. According to him, healing is a holistic transformative process. It is personal, it is innate, are naturally occurring. It is multidimensional. It involves repair and recovery of mind, body and spirit. But in all cases, the prime focus has been placed on the concept of repair recovery. This suggests, suggests that healing is not, an, not a spontaneous phenomena, rather it is a necessary best. It requires in case of a deviation from one's earlier state of being. The deviation can occur at level. It may be at micro level or macro level. In the philosophical term, the deviation can crop up at the level of body, mind, self or spirit. Therefore, dealing can, healing can, can have multiple dimensions like physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, social, communal, environmental and so on. It means healing is a dependent phenomena 
and hard to explain in isolation. But the fundamental question regarding the healing is still unanswered. Is healing an intervention or a process or an outcome of all three at time? At, as it is discussed above, healing is a dependent phenomena that is often described in the context of another complementary term that is health. Therefore, to, con to contextualize the debate of healing, it becomes essential to analyze the philosophy of health, its dimension and its determinant. Like healing, the concept of health is also constantly changing. According to the biomedical concept, the views has a health as absence of disease. Ecological concept implies health in terms of adaptation. Psychological model describe health in is both biological and social phenomena, whereas the proponent of naturalist view describe health in terms of physical, natural, biological or physiological processes that can be measured and are observable with modern technology. For example, if you understand the board's biostatistical theory of health, BST, suggests that a person is healthy if and only if all natural organ function normally given a statistically normal condition. Board's definition of normal for a functioning organ is based on species design in which each organ can be measured separately in a statistical term. But what is problematic with this definition is that it evaluates parts, not the whole body as a unified and connected system. For biostatistical theory of health, all abnormal functions are disease, but naturally it is not the case always. For example, autistic people, in this case, some organs are super functioning. In autistic case, in autistic case, organ certainly does not function following normal species design. Can it be considered unhealthy? The question remains unanswered. Whereas the holistic philosophy implies health as a value-laden phenomena. Example, vital goals, meaning and purpose. For example, the holistic theory of health suggests that a person is healthy if and only if he or she can attain their vital goal. It, in this definition, health is characterized positively in equilibrium between capabilities and goal. Though STS does not characterize health in a statistical term, at the same time it also does not characterize it in a non-biological term. For example, according to STS disease, a state of anatomical, uh, physiological and psychological that tend to restrict capabilities affect the individual capabilities. The other problem with STH is the definition of vital goal, which is a state of affair, which is either a component or of or otherwise necessary for the persons living a minimally decent life. For example, there cannot be uni universal minimal minimal decent life because it is a socio-economic contextually. The decent life of a, of a hunter-gatherer would be entirely different from sedentary community. Even in a similar socio-economic context, the minimal decent life for a moderate income individual will be different from a billionaire. The non-consideration the non of the definition of vital goal also does not make any difference. For example, what if an individual set his goal at a very low level? He or she can have many disease and malfunction, but he is, a, he is in a positive, he is in a position where he can hardly become unhealthy according to the definition of STS. However, there are various hybrid and integrative models which have tried to synthesize the concept of health and develop a philosophy of health. Therefore, the determinant of health can be anything both from the internal and external world of the view. For example, biological condition, behavioral conditions, socio-cultural condition, environment, socio-economic condition, services, age, gender, food, education, etc. Despite this, despite this, many models, several questions remain unanswered. For example, is health a proper is health a 
प्रॉपर्टी कॉन्सेप्ट और रिलेशन कॉन्सेप्ट इज हेल्थ इवेल्युएटिव और डिस्क्रिप्टिव कॉन्सेप्ट इज इट ए स्टेट ऑफ बॉडी और माइंड वॉट काइंड ऑफ लॉजिकल अपोजिशन एग्जिस्ट बिटवीन हेल्थ एंड डिजीज आर डिजीज एंड हेल्थ कॉन्ट्ररी कॉन्सेप्ट और कॉम्प्लीमेंट्री कॉन्सेप्ट हिज टू एक्सप्लोर दिस क्वेश्चन the article has the present lecture has shifted its focus towards indigenous approach of healing how do indigenous people perceive health and disease what is what is the epistemology of indigenous approach to healing and for the case studies the researcher has selected indigenous community of assam and kerala so we have selected two state and from the two both the states there is a two different means from the tri from means uh, from uh, from kerala four tribal communities were selected and from assam two tribal communities were selected so in as we all know that india is the home of 705 indigenous or tribal communities out of this 705 of india kerala is having a 35 tribal communities and assam is having 29 it is important to mention here that the term indigenous has been loosely used for tribal communities or ethnic group to avoid the confusion of term the other reason for choosing the term indigenous is that it is widely accepted and being used by the united nation scholars have outlined a few common characteristics of indigenous people which may and may not uh, may not apply to all though this characteristics make the term indigenous an unsure concept because according to this characteristics aren't we all are indigenous to some land to some land where we have born the characteristics are quite clear the historical continuity of inhibition self identification sense of belonging belongingness discrete belief system proper there is specific languages specific religion specific socio cultural practices and so on so out of 35 tribal communities of uh, uh, kerala four communities na namely chola naikian kata naikian katupanian and arandan they are selected from the from the and nilambur district value of kerala and two communities namely tai ahom and missing from assam the communities from kerala were are of nomadic and foraging community their subsistence strat uh, strategy include hunting food gathering and fishing how are the communities from assam are they are sedentary all the selected communities have their own tradition of healing which is non codified and practiced orally the data the data selected are informed this article come from both primary and secondary data sources the primary source primary data collect, uh, collection include the source uh, evaluating data in the form of in depth interview focus group discussions whereas another is ethnographic data were collected in the form of a quasi participant observation before data collection proper informed consent was was taken from the respondent and the participant now let's try to analyze the indigenous concept of health and healing based on the data that we collected so existing literature on indigenous healing uh, healing tradition equates the indigenous model of health with the holistic approach in which to ensure health uh, to health body mind spirit and emotion must be in the state of balance and harmony <coughs> any imbalance or disruption among this can be considered an illness the idea behind this behind this definition of health is the philosophy of wholeness or interrelatedness this is very broad definition of health that is interested that is interesting and inclusive but according to this definition nobody will be in the position of health because there will be will be always some or the other kind of disharmony between the internal factor and the external factor after all the term is dynamic rather than static for example every day our ecology is changing and resulting in some or other form of both internal and external imbalance can this imbalance call and call as an illness if this is so is everyone ill this is also an important note that here by no means the researcher has set out to to de de devalue or slack the above mentioned model defined uh, model or definition of indigenous health but on the other hand the attempt has been made to look for an alternative model of health with the help of indigenous wisdom health among indigenous community has three indicator one productivity second fundamental contribution to the larger goal of society and third expected 
functioning, uh, functioning behavior or abilities. These three indicators have been deduced from the interaction with selected indigenous communities of Kerala and Assam. Here, productivity implies the efficiency in the production of any kind and expected functioning behavior or abilities refer to the functioning according to the predefined, predetermined condition. In that sense, health becomes a conditional proper, uh, property of being. Like for example, there is an answer to the question, how do you know that a child or someone is sick or unhealthy in case he or she does not tell himself or herself? The common response, response from the chosen community of Nilamburg Valley Kerala were as follows. They say that, this is a very common uh, question asked through interview discussion and group discussion also. They say that the mother can understand the mood or the condition of the child. It is a common phenomena. Once they get the disease, they used to stop playing with other children, eating less and always crying. These are the common response. There is another important question. This was the common response from all the four selected communities. That the older generation people have knee and back pain issue. So they are no lo longer able to come with us in the forest. This question is, is from the one of the important community from uh, the Kerala itself. This, is, this was a response to the question cited above. It was according to the, to the focus group discussion. But this that does, does not mean health is restricted to only these three indicators of indigenous knowledge of, model of health. It has various other dimensions also like self, mind, body, emotion, culture, language and environment. For example, that's all you have five minutes. All right, sir. For example, health malfunctioning among the indigenous community can arise due to the identity, identity deficit, loss of language, changing relationship with the lands and political unrest. There are series of such models described by described by in due course of the in, in due course of the case studies. Now I'm coming to the important last part, which is a conclusive remark to this, this particular uh, discussion also, as far as the uh, result of analysis also. Now, there is a terminology related to the indigenous philosophy concern. And it is important for us to know because it's related to, to the finding of the case analysis. Here, when we see the discussion and conclusion remark, Yeah, from the above discussion, it is clear that healing, healing, has got, healing has got less philosophical attention than health. And the debate of healing revolves around the three concepts, health, disease, and normality. Health is defined in two terms, mostly as an absence of disease or presence of something. It can be also deduced from the above discussion that the naturalistic view perceives health either through empirical judgment about human physiology or normative judgment about human behavior or well-being and healing implies an act of repair or recovery whereas the indigenous approach of health coded into household practices culturally modeled belief and worldview and the knowledge system is entrenched in historical context deposited in environmental context and encompasses both the empirical that is empirical and unempirical domain moreover the religious moreover the religious background cultural belief and the cognitive mechanism are an essential part of both the perception of health and healing mechanism indigenous approach of health reasoning and logic are devised by the everyday experience and daily practices in which individual behavior is cyclic and non-reflective the rituals and mantras of indigenous approach of healing evoke the transpersonal experience and integrate the altered state of an individual consciousness with the social identity and cultural experiences. But what is the utilization of indigenous knowledge of healing? To answer this question, it is important to understand another question. Why are indigenous knowledge of healing excluded from the professional health practice, practices since the 17th century? with epistemological evol revolution, the, the, the Western medicine has reduced itself into a mere functional term by fixing to extreme empiricist model and disease discarded indigenous approach of healing because of the use of 
use of supernatural element and knowledge associated with ASC. It has resulted in the growing dissatisfaction in, in, in Western medicine because of its fragmented view, loss of the core, core, core philosophy of healing, mechanical process, non-consideration of an individual identity, culture and worldview, curative approach rather than preventive approach, inefficiency to many health problems like cancer, whereas on the other hand, indigenous approach of health functionally, functioned originally and it helped to bring a positive change and find meaning in life. In that sense, indigenous approach of health connect the self with wholeness in which Western medicine is constantly failing. Moreover, in indigenous approach of healing, the insufficiently explored knowledge of ethno-medicinal plant and ethno-geological compounds are also provides a tremendous opportunity for the search for a new medicine for deadly disease. But the technology-based development, industrial modernity, displacement-based development and capitalization of nature has collaborate, collaboratively disrupting the model of indigenous approach of healing. It is because they are, they have caused the fundamental changes in indigenous people's relationship with the environment, self, other interaction and interdependence between the self and society. It has ultimately resulted in the shifting of meaning, experience and deposition of belief, which is the core of indigenous approach of healing. Therefore, it is important to not only comprehend and appreciate appreciates the, the epistemology and metaphysics of indigenous approach of healing, but to preserve and protect the, the indigenous community and their knowledge system in, the, in their primary context for the future generation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have time for one or two quick questions. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Uh, for difficult uh, and serious uh, health conditions like uh, cancer or maybe uh, mental health, how this uh, traditional knowledge uh, is able to deal or they are not able to deal? They are able to deal, sir. Then, sir? They are, they are able to deal. The then, thing sir? is that, yes, to some extent, not greatly and not from completely. Because see, everything, if you see the, the real cause of cancer, real cause of any as such, disease, disorder or anything as such, it is mainly related to either with the environmental feature or with the genetical feature or way of living concern. If you are very clear about our complete way of living, what is called the, the systematic way of living concern, if you are very clear in that context, I don't think so we will face that problem. Another important feature is that there is a proper indication is there. Like whenever you face any as such health related issues, you have a proper indication. You yourself find it that today I am not comfortable. Some way in one form or the other. We generally go to the, the, the important phenomena is that in our so current context, we, all, we have always they taken. Are, we how have they are treating it? How they are treating it? That's what I think. That's, that's what, sir. There is a series of means. Uh, when we discuss uh, in due course of the case studies, when we discuss with them, they say that there are series of uh, biomedicinal plants are there. We have not yet deciphered or captured their material, their information properly. We just left it like this. We have not yet documented them properly. If you analyze them, like now we need the help no, of people like you no, to no, analyze I, them and prop I, I think the biggest uh, problem is the scientific validation. That's the main issue. The traditional knowledge is okay, but uh, scientific validation of these traditional uh, knowledge is very essential bring something out yeah. like like very I, I just want to quote one small ex, 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 personal experience over there in due course of the field work i had a deep health the ear pain over there i went to the medicine people they gave me some medicine and told they told he told me very clearly sir it will take minimum three times you have to take the dose then i will then only will get the relief same day same house where i was standing there was one old lady who was helping me while collecting the data what what she said don't worry sit over there she went to the kitchen, came with some hot water, with something, some leaves. Later on, I coded with that information. That leaves immediately, I don't think so, not more than 10 minutes it took to recover me from that particular pain concern. And that thing is not at all properly documented anywhere. Yeah, okay. 
we have to think sir that's what i'm doing mm. yeah okay thank you uh, please join me to thank the speaker for his talk oh. delete that one so with this so uh, we come to an end to this session and i thank each of the speakers with the for sticking the time and thank you very much for this wonderful presentation thank you thank you professor rawat and thank you speakers to enlighten us with the information informative sessions i hope it will be the very very beneficial for all the participants guests academic persons and research persons now we will gather here for the panel discussion on the topic of the next wave of the drug discovery opportunities and challenges i would like to invite professor rupesh chaturvedi JNU New Delhi Bharat I would like to invite professor Rupesh Rupesh Chaturvedi professor rupesh chaturvedi as a moderator for this session and professor peter prison mit smart and ntu singapore dr siu feng lim chief scientist officer sing zim singapore professor ravi durvasala chair of infectious disease mayo clinic florida usa as panelist
it would take two minutes. They are just arriving. Please keep your phones on silent mode. Now for the panel discussion on the topic, the next wave of drug discovery opportunities and challenges. I would like to invite Professor Rupesh Chaturvedi, JNU, New Delhi, Bharat, as a moderator for this session, and Professor Peter Prizer, MIT, SMART, and NTU, Singapore, Dr. Siu Feng Lim, Chief Scientist Officer, Sing Lim, Singapore, Professor Ravi Durvasala, Chair of Infectious Disease, Mayo Clinic, Florida, USA, as a panelist. Now I would like to hand over the session to Professor Rupesh Chaturvedi. Yeah, good afternoon, and I think this is a, a session after, uh, you know, lunch, and then there is another session. Uh, but I think the number of people are here who are participating in this discussion panel are, are with us. That's, that's a pretty encouraging number. Usually what happens after lunch, four o'clock session, you don't see a lot of people. That shows that for, you know, for at least two and a half days, you guys are you know, seeing and uh, hearing a really nice, uh, uh, you know, the presentations, which are including uh, some very new technology which have been, uh, uh, you know, have been presented here. I think, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome you all here, our esteemed guest, um, our panelist, uh, fellow colleagues, and the students also. Uh, topic of this, uh, you know, this discussion is uh, is around uh, new discoveries which has happened right now. How it's going to shape uh, scenario as well as you know landscape of uh, uh, a drug discovery, and it's a challenges and it's a advantages which is going to happen. If you look at what happened in a last one decade, it has, there is a lot of discoveries has transcended. And that has transformed the way we look at the science. And what happened, this has broken the silos of a subject, which we call physics, chemistry, maths, and biology. And you will see it has become a very much interdisciplinary. And you can see that 
if you think about the AI ML, and especially how the AI is being used, and a number of things, that's going to change uh, a couple of the way we think about the drug discovery. If you think about genomics, proteomics, it's not only way how we quantitate them, but how we visualize them, that has made a huge difference in terms of uh, how the uh, pipelines for drug discovery is going to happen. So, uh, <laughs> you know, to today evening, we are just going to hear uh, from our fellow uh, panelists about their views, uh, about uh, how this landscape is going to look like and what is our uh, challenges. And the context is going to be the new discoveries which, are, which happened in the last uh, one decade. So I think I will start with the, you know, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, so we will have a, you know, two or three questions, and I think we all will uh, chip in there. And then if there is a need, I think we will go over it. And in the end of the uh, panel discussion, I will also invite our, um, you know, um, attendees if they want to ask a, a question to us. So I think I will start with you, Peter. Uh, what are the, what do you think, what are the most promising area for research in the next wave of drug discovery and how do they meet the unmet need of uh, uh, medical sciences? Um, start with an easy question. Uh, pretty I think um, obviously you already alluded to it, it is how AI and access big data is, is now driving more and more drug discovery and, and the whole development, I think, you know, the last decade really has had a revolution in structural biology leading to now things like AlphaSalt, which has allowed us to be much more effective of predicting structures of proteins. And with that comes the ability to think about uh, drugs that are targeting this. <coughs> but the interesting thing, the unmet needs are actually the ones that have been alluded to here extensively is things, uh, drugs for infectious disease. And the challenge is that no one is interested in developing drugs for infectious disease. All the big pharma is interested in uh, treating chronic diseases. You know, there was a talk uh, l yesterday about the whole uh, pharmacoeconomics around antimicrobials. So I think there is a disconnect in the way what science can deliver and what economics dictate. So scientifically, I think we have a lot of tools available to develop new antimicrobials, to think about tackle the AMR, but there's no money in it. So people focus more on, or companies focus more on issues like type two diabetes and statins or equivalents in these chronic, uh, which make a lot of money, but really don't tackle some of the urgencies. You know, just to uh, uh, advancing this discussion, I will ask uh, uh, our fellow panelist, uh, Dr. Lane, because you are from industry, I guess. So how you see this unmet need, how we are going to really tackle, you know, how this advancement in our science which is happening, or especially in new tools which is coming, how it's going to, you know, really solve that problem what uh, uh, Mr. Peter alluded. So thank you for the question. Um, so I come from more the can cancer biology background or cancer therapeutics background. Um, I mean, Peter has already covered, you know, the anti infectious soup, I fully agree. Um, and so from the cancer therapy perspective, um, I think there is a, a lot of uh, targeted therapy that is, um, you know, emerging. Uh, one of the, them being the ADC or the antibody drug conjugates. Um, I think when we talk about unmet medical need, we, we know that um, there are many first-line uh, general uh, therapies such as chemotherapy, uh, radiotherapy, surgery. But more and more, I think uh, people are moving towards targeted therapy. And uh, the antibody drug conjugates uh, are one area of precision or, or uh, targeted cancer therapy. Um, and, and for those audience, those in the audience who are not familiar with this, 
So really it's the an, an antibody that is binding to a cancer uh, antigen expressed on the cancer cell surface and you link it to a cytotoxic uh, drug. So this can be anything like a, I would say the most commonly used ones are the microtubulin inhibitors, DNA damage uh, agents or DNA repair inhibitors. And so um, by themselves these drugs are highly toxic and systemically if you dose patients or mice, you know, there's a lot of toxicity. But by linking it to an antibody, then you have a very specific um, approach, right, in which then you significantly reduce the side effects. So I think this will continue to play a big role uh, in, in, you know, in the decades or years to come. And uh, certainly this morning I shared that there are something like about 250 clinical trials just in 2022 alone that started with ADCs. So it really shows that it's a big and emerging and exciting field. You know, just, just to um, uh, take uh, this thing further, uh, if you look at the South, you know, the global South, and there's a divide between global South and the global North in terms of uh, uh, affordability of any drug. How do you see these innovations which are coming in going to bridge that gap so that, you know, we can have an equitable distribution of these, uh, you know, nuances to uh, uh, both part of the world? I, I think you raise a good question. Um, I mean, there's always the challenge, right? Um, pharma wants to make money. So they tend to target the uh, countries that can pay and systems that you know enable the patients to pay. Um, I think w generics is one. So even with ADCs, uh, antibodies oftentimes could be antibodies that have already gone off pattern and you can link it to a cytotoxic drug that is, could be a very old drug um, that is coming off pattern. For example, uh, I would say one of the oldest, um, we call them payloads, right? One of the drugs that's being used in ADCs is um, MMAE and it's from a company called Seachen, which recently been bought over by Pfizer. But it's coming off pattern. So basically there is that potential freedom to operate, to, to use those kind of drugs. Um, and and again, innovation can come from anywhere. Innovation may not necessarily come from northern countries or in the northern hemisphere. Um, I think, you know, there if there's a will and, and, and there's an interest and, and desire, I think innovations can come from um, developing countries too. And, and trying to put together an antibody and a drug is not, not rocket science. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I will just leave the same question to Professor Ravi also. You know, you are an infectious disease expert. So if you look at the AMR, and Peter also alluded about that, that you know, AMR is, is, is uh, if you look at this, a global south, south, global south problem. Pharmas don't make the money on that. So how you see these new innovations which are coming, bringing a cost down in terms of, uh, you know, because nowadays if you look at uh, a lot of companies, they are, using AI ML to really reduce the cost of the uh, development process because mm -hmm. they are cutting up. Recently, FDA also said that, you know, for a preclinical trials, um, non-animal models of uh, uh, sporad and other things will be accepted as good as the anim uh, clinical animal uh, models also. So I think in view of that, what do you think, how it's going to move forward? Because, you know, in the end, what matters is uh, how these technology is going to improve are distributed equitably in, in a global uh, sense. <coughs> well, thank you. That's a it's a loaded question, and you know, without easy answers. But before we talk about equitable distribution of technology, I, I would like to follow up something that Dr. Lin um, and Dr. Preiser said have said that. Um, in the field of infectious diseases, so this is this is my field and, and, and what I work in both clinically and in the lab. Uh, we have a drug discovery program at Mayo. Um, and we contrast where we are now with where the field of clinical oncology is and where oncology was 15 years ago. Um, you know, there was a time in oncology when patients largely were treated with toxic, broad chemotherapy agents. They blew out everything. It's like treating with a machine gun and hoping that you hit your target. 
And, and really, this was a lot of what clinical oncology was. And now, you know, as you've mentioned, the number of precision-guided molecules that target specific nucleic acid pathways or the antibody uh, 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 conjugates, so many things, even things like with the evolution of CAR T-cell therapy, um, are very, very exciting. If you then look at the field of infectious diseases <clears throat> and we follow the pathway of antimicrobial resistance and these um, multi-drug resistant organisms um, globally, and India has a big role to play in some of the carbapenemase resistant gram negatives, things like that. You know, it's that game of cat and mouse of designing the better antibiotic, and if you go to carbapenems, and then you go to the new ones, and you go to sifidricol, and all the things that are coming out, it doesn't take long before you're getting, of course, the target resistance. But we are still developing drugs that blow apart the microbiome, that, that, that it, it's the machine gun, okay? And so really where I see the exciting opportunities in infectious diseases, and, and there is research still much earlier stage than where oncology has taken it, in areas like um, targeting uh, biofilm formation for multidrug resistant pseudomonas in cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, many, many, many uses for that. Targeting um, quorum signaling molecules that are involved in the pathogenesis of Staph aureus, pseudomonas, some of the vibrios. Um, many exciting, exciting areas that are not developed necessarily around just finding something that blows open bacterial cells and with it, you know, all kinds of other things. So I think that that's an exciting area. Now to get to that issue of cost, you know, I, I, I share some of the comments that, that it's a little hard to talk about generic versions of brand new antibiotics. I mean, they're, they're, they're not out yet, let's face it. But there are some different opportunities if there are um, other tools to target consortium infections, biofilm forming organisms, some of the chronic MDRO infections like Pseudomonas, um, the hope sometimes is you may restore susceptibility in some of these clones and populations, say in a hospital or in a community, to some of the lower, you know, tier uh, drugs that are cheaper, that, that are available, things like quinolones, et cetera. So that may be one strategy. So if you use the technology to be able to restore some of those, and then in, in there are other strategies targeting things like inflammatory pathways and all that may not carry the same costs. Still early, you know, there's a few exciting drugs that are being looked at for um, lung infections that are more in the realm of um, consortium disease, consortium management, not antibiotics. So we'll see. I think that, that you know, the jury's out on some of that. <coughs> So you know, moving forward, if you think about uh, you know, the way we have a ability to see the proteomics genomics data right now, and it's not only in the you know how we uh, you know how we compute them, and also in terms of how we visualize them, and I think that's that's another thing which is uh, becoming pretty uh, uh, powerful. But if you look at these are going to create a lot of data sets. And we are. It's like right now we are in the midst of a, a storm of a data sets. Sometime, you know, those data is not pretty uh, curated. That's, that's another problem uh, because there's not a much standard around the world you see. But it's still those data are curated. But the another problem which uh, we do face is democratization of the data. If the data is available, how we can make it available to everybody? Because you know that's that's the source of information. So how do you think? You know, I would like one by one uh, from Peter how the academics can help in there. From you, uh, how we are going to how the industry is looking at that. What kind of uh, uh, you know uh, technological innovations they are trying to put around so that they don't lose the profit 
but uh, still they can make that data available to the public. And uh, Professor Ravi, your uh, inputs about you know how, particularly in terms of uh, uh, infectious disease, especially because you know how the climate is changing, uh, you know the climate finance, climate infrastructure is going to be built around that. I think those are going to be a very important thing which we will encounter in the next one decade probably. So I just want to have uh, yeah, your views on these things. Uh, Vijay. Yeah, I think the accessibility of data has been an issue, but I think there's a really a shift uh, globally by funding agencies, particularly about that academic research that there is a policy of making the data publicly available. And, and that is a push w that's happening everywhere. So a lot of the big data sets are now being deposited in publicly accessible data, whether it's proteomic genomics, there are specific databases that are available. A lot of times also the journals themselves now make a lot of the, the data available even if they are sort of subscription links. So I think that problem is actually being tackled. I think the bigger problem is the actual annotation with the data and the what makes data comparable. I think more effort maybe needs to be done at a global level to standardize data sets so that really anyone can compare a study that's done in Florida with a study that's done in Singapore and a study that's done here and not really have, you know, yes, the data is, but it's, can't be compared. So I think that is uh, from a, I think an issue that's been recognized and that's being tackled. And uh, also much more this idea of open access uh, journals, more of the data comes out that way as well. So it is still a challenge, but I think the challenge isn't so much with the data itself, but with the way that how the data gets annotated. And I think that's uh, something that needs to be dealt with, particularly in areas like proteomics and metabolomics, uh, where every machine that you run gives you slightly different data sets. So, um, yeah. so um, to add on to what Peter said, so um, I mean, when I think about my own experience um, as a, you know, when I'm doing, like say, looking into cancer biology and trying to understand patient data or um, for the matter, even cancer cell line data. So there are uh, databases available like the Human um, Protein Atlas, uh, CBioPorter, uh, GPR. So these are some of these um, publicly available uh, cancer genomics and cancer proteomics data that one can turn to. So, um, so in the sense, I kind of do agree with Peter that there are you know, more things that you can turn to without having to pay. But of course, um, big pharma will always have their own proprietary data sets that they work with large hospitals with and, you know, curate the data accordingly. Um, so maybe I can share that from, from my time when, before I joined Singzyme, I was in the, uh, one of the Singapore research uh, institutes. And this is part of the um, Agency for uh, Science and Technology, so the, what we call the ASTAR collectively. So in the, in this collection of um, research institutes, there is one institute that's dedicated to bioinformatics, and they play the role to try and collate um, all the data that's coming from the hospitals, patient data, um, and sometimes in some cases just research data, so that there's a central depository. And if you think about what the Singapore government is trying to do also, is that they are also sequencing the genome of, you know, firstly 10,000 human <coughs> healthy people, and then later on trying to also sequence the genome or get in transcriptomics um, data uh, for local patients. So in a way, you are trying to build up your own capabilities and your own, um, let's say, uh, even I would call it you know, intellectual property, right? And, and I think there is value in that because um, w as an Asian country or, or primarily Asian-focused, um, you know, um, uh, let's say, drug discovery efforts, um, it, it may, the data set may not, um, may provide insights that you don't have from patient data from say Caucasian or, or North America. So there will be subtle differences. So I think it makes sense to, you know, initiate your own um, national kind of curation. Yeah. Yeah, help, yeah. 
sure, I think that's, that's, that's the one option. Yeah, Professor Ali. And I, <coughs> those are, I think, some excellent points that Dr. Lim has made that, <coughs> you know, I, to be honest, okay, let's say, if you go to a big pharma that invests a lot of money in the development of very precision therapeutics, whether it's for oncology or you know, cancer, uh, for uh, cardiovascular disease, whatever, um, it is challenging to say, turn this over so that it becomes available to everybody at a low cost. Um, that, that there will be hurdles, we know that. Um, but this idea that, that we can develop, and there's been a lot of effort, you talked about a, a good effort in Singapore, the, the uh, Veterans Administration in the US through what's called the Million Veterans Program has sequenced these genomes. There are umpteen number of these types of things going on around the world. So it's not just in highly developed countries where these genomic databases become available. <coughs> in the field of infectious disease, if you want to do surveillance for community origins of drug resistance, this has been done with C. diff, it's been done with MRSA. <coughs> Again, these are things that can be done in many countries to create that, that actionable database um, upon which you know, uh, discovery and, and other things can happen. So I, I think that that is important, but, but there will be the challenge that of, you know, very expensive, I mean, engineered biologics for cancer or for inflammatory bowel disease and all, they cost a lot. These are expensive drugs, uh, even in the United States. So, so we're gonna think about that. You would ask about climate change. Yes. And I just wanna mention, so in July of last year, the CDC reported eight cases of malaria in Florida yeah. and Texas. And these are autochthonous transmissions, okay? So they're not imported. We get 1,000 to 1,500 cases a year of malaria in the US. Pretty much all of it's imported, people coming in from travel and all that. But these were cases traced to local reservoirs, which, you know, when you look at the exploding populations of both Florida and Texas, and the implications of this, um, and, and tying it, of course, perhaps to patterns of, of climate change and vector patterns and migration, it has a profound impact. And one of the things, as someone who studies vector-borne disease and parasite, parasitic disease, which is, of course, you know, woefully underfunded. All the money goes to cancer research. But, um, you know, one of the first things we thought kind of cynically is, wow, now there might be money <laughs> for yeah. malaria research in the United States because suddenly malaria is, you know, it's in Florida. Um, but, but I think this does point out that, that the traditional divides, you know, you call them north-south, whatever you want to call them, in some of these diseases which I think have led to this concept of neglected tropical diseases versus unneglected, you know, diseases of affluence. Um, some of that will change. Um, Chagas disease has appeared on the southern border of the United States, you know, malaria. There have been isolated cases of leishmaniasis. So I think some of these certainly um, will play a role in climate, what it does to vector patterns and disease patterns um, will probably pl play a role in all this. Yeah. So, you know, if we think, you know, let's move the room on, um, you know, now technology itself, and let's see how we can, uh, you know, think about that, how it's going to change in the next uh, uh, decade, you know, especially if you are thinking about targeted uh, therapies. How to decorate uh, any, uh, vehicle which directly target where it should go. Especially, you know, the cancer as well as the infection biology also directly targeting a type of a bacteria, targeting a type of uh, cell. And in oncology it become more uh, specific because if you are targeting uh, some immune cells, you want to be very specific. Example is, uh, you know, uh, we work with you know, uh, 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 colitis and uh, there is a, a very specific population which is, uh, uh, you know, FOX P3 positive, 
and its uh, PRDM1 negative and its ROR gamma positive and IL-17 negative. And that's the holy grail of uh, colitis. If you will be able to really deplete that population or reprogram that population somehow, again towards the T regulatory cell, especially um, a FOXP3 positive and um, IL-10 expressing, probably we will have a possible cure in that, that area. So considering that precision, how do you see these new advancement, whether it's a CAR T cell therapy, or uh, you know, um, uh, AI ML, or our ability to visualize, or our ability to synthesize new molecules, tag them, put put them on a, any any vehicle which we can decorate, creating a new material, biomaterials which are compatible and can be utilized for a, a drug delivery. So, what is you see in the next one decade where we will be with these things? Are these are going to be what we'll call it the panacea for you know a lot of disease where we uh, can think that it could be a very targeted precision based uh, uh, therapies. So let's start with Professor Ravi, and then we will come back to uh, Lim and uh, uh, Peter. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll be very honest and, and tell you what I what I tell all of our clinical trainees in the hospital that um, I say I wish the field of infectious diseases could be even just a fraction of, you know, sort of the level of advancement of clinical oncology. And what oncology has done in terms of this level of precision and being able to target those kinds of very specific mutations, it is happening, as you mentioned, in areas like inflammatory colitis, some of the rheumatologic diseases, and even the neurologic diseases are moving ahead. I hate to say it, but I think the field of infectious diseases is still relying on trying to find new antibiotics, and there's still a lot of effort on that, which we, we shouldn't lose sight of. But, um, you know, what would I like to see in 10 years is probably, you know, I can tell you one of the, the, the bane of our existence in hospitals now is uh, methicillin-resistant staff. We, we drown in MRSA. It is now over 50% of community isolates, and we see it in many, many, many settings in the hospital. And trying to eradicate it, trying to eradicate deep-seated foci and people with prosthetic joints and hardware and lines and all that stuff is very difficult. So where I'd like to see the field of infectious diseases move, and I think it is moving, is again, less focus on trying to kill the bacteria and more focus on trying to kill the bacteria's communication systems, the, the quorum sensing systems, the biofilm formation, and everything I just said with MRSA, we can transpose it to Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is our other big problem throughout the hospitals. So, um, you know, where I'd like to see the field go will be a much more, um, you know, focus on the biology of these infections as opposed to eradicating bacteria, which are impossible, as we know, to eradicate. So that, that's what I'm, I'm really hoping we can do. Um, and, you know, obviously there will always be efforts to try to find the next generation of, of antimicrobials, but I, maybe the pure drug discovery people know more about this than I do, but I'm not sure about that. But, but th those, are, those are the areas I'd like to see. Especially thinking about, you know, I think there was a famous um, paper from, uh, I think, Washiu from uh, Garden group that they showed that uh, uh, if you eradicate, you know, do a use of uh, antibiotics in a mice makes them uh, obese. Yeah. And we do have a correlation in there. So I think that that's the one thing I want your opinion about. And, and I will just add one more thing parenthetically. You, you, you touch on the, the microbiome work when a lot of it's come out of WashU, but many other places. And, and trying to understand that um, some of these, and it's not just infectious diseases. These are neurologic diseases. These are metabolic diseases. Potentially even cancers um, may be a function of the interplay in the human microbiome. 
And so, you know, looking at that as a reservoir where new therapeutics may come in um, could be, you know, a, a th there's an association between some of the inflammatory bowel diseases and the ability of human PANF cells mm -hmm. to produce some of the um, alpha defensins. And so, and that pathway goes through the gut microbiome. So when you start looking at, at that interplay, there can be a world of options, uh, new options for therapeutics. So that, I, I, I agree with you fully. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Lynn. So I, I was, I just want to pick up on what you said about innovation um, or new therapies such as CAR T cells. So I mean, my feeling is that there has been a lot of innovation in the biologics space. Um, you mentioned CAR T, there's uh, NK cell therapy, um, you know, things like bispecific T cell engagers or, or tri-specific T cell or NK cell engagers. So, and, and also, in terms of antibody therapy uh, for biologics, I mean, we've also seen a lot of immunocheckpoint inhibitors that work very well. So, I mean, thinking like for large molecules, it has been, you know, very exciting in the last decade or so. Um, of course, it still remains to be seen, right, whether some of this eventually, um, you know, how it will be for the patients in 10 to 20 years. CARTIS, for example, recently has been slapped with a black box warning for secondary T cell uh, cancers, right, in patients who have been treated, in some a small population of pa patients who have been treated with CAR-T therapy. Um, and whether like NK cell therapy and, and this, I would call them um, chimeric proteins, whether they pan out uh, remains to be seen, but certainly there's a lot of activity going on and there's a lot of potential to, to then, to um, influencing the immune response, then um, be able to, uh, you know, engage uh, cancer cell killing. And then on the flip side, um, when you think about small molecules, um, oftentimes traditionally small molecules is really one target, uh, one chemical molecule. Um, but in more recently, people have started to explore more like, um, you know, targeted protein degradation uh, molecules, whereby uh, one molecule may have one side that interacts with protein A, and, and then another side or another moiety that interacts with uh, protein B. And in a way, it acts like a molecular glue. And actually, these have been around for a long time, but nobody really studied them or knew what their mechanism of action is, such as the immunosuppressant, psychosporin, uh, et cetera. But more and more, people now start to understand this, that this actually is a very interesting um, class of molecules um, that is like a PPI, right, protein-protein interactor. But now they give you a fancy name, right? It's called molecular glue. <laughs> but I think this could, um, this is an emerging and exciting field, uh, and, and it's also useful and, and probably good for targeting proteins that are tradition, protein classes that are traditionally difficult to target. They are, for example, not enzyme-based. They could be transcriptional factors. Um, and in fact, for molecular glues and the immuno, um, like the thalidomide and, and its analogs, these are molecular glues that actually are inhibiting transcription factors and causing them to be degraded by E3 ligases and the proteasome that then leads to, you know, cancer killing. So, um, yeah, so I, I think the protein targeted protein degradation is, is definitely an area that is very exciting and could bring new area, um, new advantages that, you know, uh, and allow you to target classes that you couldn't before. Um, and then just to complete the part about the protein uh, degradation is there is the other group, um, what we call the protex. So these are actually pretty large molecules. Um, they have one chemical moiety that is interacting with your target, a linker sequence, and then is joined to another chemical moiety which then is binding to oftentimes an E3 like this. So these are very large molecules. Um, and the drawback then is that they oftentimes are not orally bioavailable, so you have to, you know, um, uh, do intravenous in, uh, injection to, get to treat the patients. Um, but, yeah, and extending beyond that, people are also looking at degrading RNA as well by pulling together RNA and, 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 and other uh, RNAs so that they can uh, lead to RNA that, uh, targeting. So, yeah. You mentioned something I just wanted to 
throw this out in terms of, again, emerging technologies and infectious disease. Um, you talk about CAR T cell therapy and, and how successful it's been in myeloma with uh, AML, some of those particular ones. And then the new technology that's just been announced, the CAR T with CRISPR, and, and, and how that may, again, take it even further. So there's a group out of MD Anderson in Houston um, that's now, just in October, published data on development of CAR T cell therapy for invasive fungal infections, which can be very hard to eradicate in immunosuppressed patients, uh, invasive aspergillosis and some of the mass-forming fungal infections. So it's actually on the horizon to start looking at that as a potential for infectious diseases. So I'm really cheering them on. So we'll, we'll see where we go. <laughs> Uh, especially in a you know infectious disease, I think later or sooner we have to think about uh, you know specific delivery and how to utilize these uh, decorators and the caspers uh, so that we can get the maximum benefit out of that. So Peter, for you, we heard about you know about this question um, a view from a clinician, from a person industrial. Now, what do you think as a basic scientist and uh, you know? Uh, person who really interact with uh, uh, basic machinery of a science, and it has another question which I will ask next. Uh, well, it's interesting listening to, to the, the discussion so far because we are, um, and, and the, the people I work with, have been thinking a lot about the challenges about the anti infectives, but I think it's not just anti it also applies for cancer, is not to use a machine gun. So very targeted therapy, not killing the whole microbiome, but really trying to kill what you want to kill. And um, the biggest challenge around is actually that often treatment is initiated without actually knowing what is there. So I think a, a, a key technology which really we are needing and should be uh, become more and more available is rapid diagnosis of the disease-causing agent, whatever that is. And using that because, I mean, even in the cancer field, you need to know what cancer you're targeting before you can design your antibodies, etc. In infectious diseases, a lot of times, we have no clue. I mean, in a hospital, you know because you know what's circulating there permanently. But when a patient, a new patient comes in, you often don't know. And there, you go do some screening and you give them some antibiotics and hope that it does. So I think... What needs to be developed along with better therapeutics is actually better diagnostics. The other aspect is actually I think we potentially could deal with AMR if we uh, focus uh, very much more on understand why does resistance develop in the first place? What are the key root causes of why we have all these problems with antimicrobial resistance? And it's misuse, overuse, inappropriate use, all these aspects. And also, I think, very much the unwillingness to, um, to take advantage of the information we have. W uh, it would be, uh, if you, th you can do a lot of modeling along with things, is what happens if you start recycling antibiotics in a, in a community? So as soon as something appears to, um, uh, resistance or indication of re take that antibiotics off the market, put another one on. So I don't think, sometimes I think we go for the really fancy tools. We actually do have tools available if we were actually willing to implement them and that obviously has to do with regulators and, 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 and sort of a whole public health policy that needs to be in this. So I think yes, we need new strategies and I think helping particularly in the infectious diseases um, helping the immune system itself facilitating better innate responses at, uh, that are being looked at but I think also I don't think we're going to get away with out having some drugs which kill the bugs um, and um, but making better use of them is I think the the key hurdle right now we use, I mean, um, w 
I, I know this from the field of malaria. We've been using artemisinin with combination therapy. We know that artemisinin is failing. We still keep using it. So now we have really super resistant uh, malaria parasites against artemisinin and in conjunction resistant to the partner drugs because that's what the, uh, these parasites have been selected on. So ultimately we are not using the knowledge that comes from surveillance to drive policy and to actually allow us to protect the drugs that we have. I think there's a real disconnect uh, in, in the what surveillance information we get and how we use it to actually drive policy. Those are excellent, excellent points. I have to say, you know, uh, two weeks ago I was on the hospital service. We actually had a patient with a group B strep invasive bloodstream infection, diabetic patient. And I, I told our students and residents that bring out the intravenous penicillin. I said, you can treat this. The MIC, we knew it. It's a fantastic mm -hmm. drug for it. And they all looked at me like, are you, are you crazy? You know, why, why would we use penicillin? That used to be used, you know, so many years ago when there are these big, sexier, you know, big gun antibiotics. And, and you're right, this ability to, to target when you can is important. Um, unfortunately, and, and, and the subject of antimicrobial stewardship, which goes hand in hand with the study of anti microbial um, resistance is a very big part now in a lot of hospitals, and hospitals are actually part of our quality metrics include, you know, rates of these infections, things like Clostridium difficile, which arise in hospitals directly correlated to the use of fluoroquinolones. That's a well-known association. So there are many, many methods, but I would agree with uh, you know Peter 100 percent. There, there many more are needed to control the use of these drugs, and and you know let's face it, some of them are people. People look at them as well. They're bigger, powerful, and newer. You know, why would we ever use penicillin, penicillin when, yeah. when in fact there are times you can use it and it works beautifully. So it it, it is a big a big problem yeah. in, in that area. So you know, Peter, you alluded up why. Uh, you know, a, a specific point about, uh, you know, the social innovation, like how to teach a people not to overuse it, what what kind of, you know, there could be a, some, uh, you know, the innovations coming in there. And it's also a part of the contour of your overall drug development process because these are the where it feeds in into the system. So, you know, that bring us to our uh, last segment of our discussion. That's already uh, 45 minutes. But it's uh, so captivating that we all are uh, adhered to it. But you know, if you think about how the advancement is happening, I will give you a couple of examples, like Neuralink. Uh, another is generative AI. All these are going to have an impact in terms of uh, you know, this will require a kind of ethical monitoring. So, question is how this technology is going to work on the realm of, you know, what we call it ethics versus unethics, especially looking at the how the open uh, AI is going uh, ahead, especially with the um, uh, open AI company, which is uh, Altman has put it in there. Elon Musk idea of having a neural link, you know, it's, it's a good idea, and it can be utilized for further a lot of a better, uh, uh, better things. But what kind of, uh, you know, we need to provide a, a protection. I think that's the another part which we need to also think about, formulate. And if you if we won't think today, I think tomorrow it will be too late for us. Uh, I would like to have your views and then we will uh, open this discussion for uh, uh, a further question from our attendees. Yeah, Peter. I think you gave me the toughest question. Um, I think um, okay, let me just on the flight over here, I saw Oppenheimer for the first time. And I think it is the classical dilemma 
that anyone faces with new technology, it, 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 it can do positive things and it can be misused. And technology in itself is agnostic. You know, it, it's, 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 it's what you do with it which drives whether it has, you know, a positive or negative impact. And in biology and in sciences, and all the things we're talking about right now, it's, it's, it's exactly the same thing. Um, I think, particularly for things like AI, the genie is out of the bottle. You know, it, 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 everyone can have access to it in some way, and it can be, uh, and you know, it can be modified and improved upon and, and do things better, which could mean it does things worse. Um, I think the whole thing is, how do we prevent misuse or uh, not accept misuse? Is a question of of ethical education. I think that's the only way it at, at all levels that from everyone learns what is right and wrong. And a lot of times when I uh, listen even to university students who should be, uh, so they lack this, what I would some of ethic common sense. They propose things, you sort of think, have you thought about what that implies? And then they haven't. So I think, um, you know, I'm in, in that respect, I'm relatively pessimistic, especially for technology, which isn't really, you know, anyone can do at home. You know, you, 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 you know with some of the molecular biology and, and uh, techniques, they're not that easily accessible to, but AI, anyone who has a computer now has access to it. And it's, I, I find it as scary, uh, but I think the, the main thing is that uh, there are people have you the right ethical compass of what is what. So, so I don't have a good answer to this one. Um, and so I hand on the microphone to someone who might have a better answer. <laughs> you have meant, uh, industry is going to be really get hit hardest with this, and especially clinical, the way we do the clinical practices. I think your views from both of you will be really valuable in this limb. Big Pharma definitely has a lot of rules and regulations in place uh, for their employees, right? They have an overarching uh, system. For so I'm not concerned about AI abuse by Big Pharma. I think it's more, you know, I, Peter has alluded to it in some ways, like more the person at home with the computer, the, the unknowns, right? Um, so yeah, I think there's no, I think simplistically, one could say, okay, you know, maybe there should be some kind of international guidelines, some rules, some bodies formed, etc. But would that actually be effective? Probably not. So, I mean, one can lay down all the rules and say what work, what you should do and what you should not do. But how do you in, how do you actually enforce someone to follow that? I think it's going to be tough. Yeah. Um, I think Peter has the right answer, which is like you know, it's moral compass educational, um, you know, uh, I, I, you know the, how, how well a person is in, um, educated and, and understanding in terms of what your moral responsibility and social responsibility is. And, and then it falls back on all of us, either as parents, educators, you know, to ensure that um, the right message gets passed along. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Hopefully we can provide an answer. It's a tough question. But, and again, I'll give you a, a, a clinical perspective where going back to something which now seems simple, you know, IBM Watson and its ability to, you know, make a diagnosis and compare that to what, you know, a human can do. The role of, um, you know, some of the uh, artificial intelligence in, in radiology diagnoses, the role of that in the diagnosis of cardiac dysrhythmias. You know, we've got examples of this at different levels that have fully worked their way into clinical medicine. And, you know, regulatory and some of those things, I, I think about it, um, and, and I'm sure others in this audience probably know much more about it, but from a perspective of being able to integrate disparate 
fields and, and, and databases to predict outcomes in our patients, I think this is, will be a blessing. I, 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 I welcome it with open arms. You know, the idea, for example, Dr. Kampaya talked about the role of multiomics analysis, complex level multiomics analysis in malaria, long COVID, all these different <coughs> infectious diseases, and being able to put together all of these different areas from transcriptomics to the metabolome to the phenome to all of these to come up with, you know, diagnostic um, directions for patients, targets for new therapies. Um, and and when can this can be done at the level of, you know, at the bedside, if we could capture that kind of information in our medical decision making in real time, it is a revolution, revolution, because a human brain cannot do that. I, I do not think that as a physician, I can look at my patient and look at not only what I see in front of me, what the biochemical data are, but the genetic data, the proteomic data, the population level data, there's just no way that a, a, a single doctor can do that. Whereas if we can put those things together in usable um, algorithms, which I think where we're headed, I know Dr. Chitali will tell us more about that because he's working on it, but um, I, I think it's a revolution. And I actually am incredibly optimistic about it. Um, Peter's point, very valid that we should you know, try to contain the genie when it's out of the bottle, but the point is there's so much good that can come in the field of clinical medicine. Thank you very much. I think, uh, you know, this discussion is very delightful and we touched upon, you know, a number of, uh, 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 you know, issues which uh, we will see in the next coming uh, decade. I again like to thank you all and I think we are running sort of a time. So uh, uh, after uh, next session, we will have a time and I think we can discuss with our panelist. Again, thank you for uh, coming. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Please be seated. Yeah. Please be seated. Now I would like to invite Dr. Rohit Chitale. Hello. For the panel, for sorry, for the keynote lecture. Dr. Rohit Chitale, Mayo Clinic, Florida, USA. He is a supplemental consultant at Mayo Clinic, Alex School of Medicine. Infectious disease epidemiologist with 25 years of experience in national and international program. His expertise include disease surveillance, outbreak response, and technology development of disease control. He has extensive experience in pediatric infectious disease across Africa and Asia, supporting programs for 18 years. Dr. Chitale has consulted for organizations such as Bill and AMP, <coughs> Melinda Gates Foundation, and the World Health Organization. And he has served as various US and international working groups. A native of Washington, DC, he holds degrees from University of Maryland UCLA and Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Now I would like to invite Professor D.S. Rawat for the keynote lecture. Now I would like to uh, invite Kunjan Ma'am to felicitate D.S. Rawat sir. Now 
I would like to invite Dr. Dinesh Agrawal to felicitate our chairman, Rohit Chitale, sir. Now I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Rohit Chitale. Hello, can you hear me okay in the back? Yes, raise your hand. All right, so I think we're in the last session uh, between now and the cultural festival and maybe some kanapina, some, some food and drink. So, so I am Rohit Chitlehai. I am a Maharashtrian origin, but I live in the US. Um, I gave a talk yesterday on AI and drug discovery and disease detection. Did anybody get to sit? But on that, it didn't go to, it was very short. But um, here I am to introduce to you Dr. Professor Rawat, who is a senior professor of chemistry at the University of Delhi, also Vice Chancellor at uh, Kuman University, Nanital Uttarakhand, uh, here in India. So his title of his talk uh, will be on Parkinson's disease, Navigating the Expected and Unexpected Twists and Turns of Lead Optimization the discovery of clinical candidates for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Dr. Uh, Professor Rawat is currently serving, as I mentioned, as Vice Chancellor in Nanithal University. He completed his PhD at the Central Drug Research Institute in Lucknow. He pursued postdoctoral studies in Indiana University and Purdue University in the United States. He held positions as an assistant professor at uh, NIPER, N-I-P-E-R, Mohali, and later joined Delhi University in 2003. Uh, Professor Rawat has had an extensive research portfolio comprising of 166 plus papers, a book, five chapters, 11 patents with over 7,000 citations, an age index of 49, which is well, at least more than double mine. So <laughs> very impressive. Um, and an uh, I, I-10 index of 132. His compounds are uh, undergoing phase one trials for Parkinson's treatment. Um, he supervised 27 PhD students. His Parkinson's research was published in Nature Communication, which is really quite a feat. Uh, Professor Rawat has served as president of the Chemical Sciences section of the Indian Science Congress for one year, 2019 to 2020, uh, and holds a visiting professor at the Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. So I, I'm actually, as a medical epidemiologist working with Dr. Ravi, who you saw, very excited to see uh, Dr. Roberts, uh, Roberts' talk on Parkinson's, such an important uh, topic with you know, many, not many uh, notable uh, people like Michael J. Fox in the United States who suffer from Parkinson's. A really big challenge It's one of the neurodegenerative diseases, one of the big five diseases, chronic diseases, starting to five categories of diseases really affecting people as we move forward. So over to you, Dr. Ravat. Thank you. Am I audible? Yeah, okay. Uh, very good afternoon, all of you. Uh, let me thank my colleague, Dr. Vijay Srati, for inviting me here and making such a beautiful program. Uh, generally, as the previous speaker said, in the most of the time, the, these kind of conferences nowadays, you don't see audience sitting in the hall, five, 10 people, if you are there, you are lucky. But since yesterday what I saw, even in my previous uh, the speakers, Dr. Bhatt and everybody will agree that the 
there is a large number of audience here and it's the last talk is mine so still the hall is almost half more than half full thank you for that and i thank bridges for uh, for another point actually because as i was introduced by uh, dr rohit that uh, i am a vice chancellor so in india actually the vice chancellor never makes a scientific presentations they sit on the dais and talk all those topics which they never studied with so i requested him i don't want to sit anywhere please give me chance to speak the science which i do so that i am alive in the academic world uh, with this uh, as uh, introduced so i have these uh, two affiliations so i am a senior professor at university of delhi but currently i am at kumai university in nainital chalega what is not working sorry okay so this is university of delhi and this building used to be occupied by the viceroy till 1933 very very powerful building and in this building many important things happened the gandhi even pact was signed in one of those rooms then you must have seen the picture of uh, bhagat singh sitting on a cot and that is the place is also underground of this he was kept here and the another important thing happened in this building that was mount betan proposed lady mount betan in one of the room now occupied by the registrar of the university and this is the central block of chemistry department and my office is to this side and my research lab lies to that side but now i am at a new place it is called kumayu university it is located in nainital since july 2023 and this is the academic block of the uh, university we have nine faculties 33 departments sanctioned post in 2000 2005 colleges are affiliated to it and student strength is about 70000 and my accommodation is somewhere here because uh, my family resides at delhi i am alone here and that's the house but i am asked not to come out during night time alone because i have a very good campaign in here there are three leopards in the street so even if i go for walk i i usually go to alone actually to the market also so but when i come back if i'm late the you know, the night then two three guards will come and escort me here and put inside they said don't open the door now so this is what my life is nowadays and this is the campus actually this is what we call a dsb campus it was established in 1951 and this is the beautiful lake of uh, nainital this is about 2 km away from my uh, administrative block so if i want to have a surprise visit here so i come out from the car it's not like delhi because you have multiple ways you can turn around but in hills you don't have you have only one way to go so once you take a car they will make a phone he is coming so everybody is present there so uh, this is the beautiful city uh, the summer view of uh, nainital city this is how it looks like but winter is very cold so it snow a lot it looks like it's during the snow time and night is beautiful if you click the picture from the top it looks like this so when i joined there i thought let's try to teach I go to the classroom so that after 3 years if i come back i don't forget my teaching because this is what i'm known for so i started going to the teaching to the msc students uh, this is the classroom in which i studied as a student in 1993 so after exactly 30 years i'm in the same classroom now teaching my students there we have beautiful museum actually in the university geology museum has the human skeleton not only that they have human embryo which is very difficult to get even in the medical schools 
and we have an elephant jaw of 2.5 million year ago. Then we have history museum, sorry, and this gold coin is as old as 145 BC, and these silver coins are from Muhammad Shah time from 1719, and many antique pieces are kept over here, so it's a good place to visit sometime. So with this, let me come back what I want to talk to you today. As a chemist, organic chemist, we know our organic chemistry started with this discovery, the urea, synthesized by Euler, way back in 1828. And Euler was not a chemist, he was a medical. So his supervisor, J.J. Berzelius, trained him in a chemistry and his Berzelius hypothesis was that you cannot synthesize organic compounds in the lab. That is called a vitalism. But his student at the age of 28, he synthesized urea in the lab and discredited the hypothesis of J.J. Berzelius. And that's the first synthetic compound called chlo chloral hydrate, used as a hypertonic. And then the recent drug is this. So from this to this, what happened? How much chemistry has influenced the human life? At 1900, the average life in India at birth was about 23 years old. There are many Brazilian over here, so it is about 30 years. Now India's life has gone up to this. So chemistry has played a pivotal role on this. So whenever you go to the, this kind of presentation as a medicinal chemist, at the end of the talk, people should not ask the question whether you have developed a drug or not. So you show this slide first, how easy it is. So if a medicinal chemist synthesizes 10,000 compounds, one compounds come to the clinical market as a drug, it takes about 15 to 16 years, 15 to 18 years, and total cost of the drug discovery, average cost is about 460 million US dollar, and this comes this much of rupees. So I hope I will not count encounter such question at the end. It's very difficult, costly, Time consuming, so there are ways how to design drug. These are the four or five different ways of designing drug. We work on this concept called a hybrid drug. What is that? If you look at this plant, you must have seen this plant around, right? So this plant has been a source of more than 70 alkaloids have been isolated from this out of which the structure of these two compounds I have shown here. Both of these compounds have shown poor anti-cancer activity. But the same plant produced two more molecules. This one, this is called vincristin. And if you have a methyl here, that is called vinblastin. Vincristin and vinblastin have been in, you know, licensed by FDA in 1963 for the treatment of leukemia. So it means what nature has taught us that if you have a two molecules, pharmacophores, if you connect those something like this or fuse it, the molecule can have a better medicinal properties. Not only that, Professor Mehta has summarized his work in this, what he said that the compounds which are synthesized through multiple biosynthetic pathways showed better biological activities than the molecules which are synthesized through single biosynthetic pathway. That knowledge was available in the literature, but synthetic medicinal chemistry, people did not use it for longer period of time. What we thought, we thought this is a chloroquine molecule. So we thought take this part of chloroquine and this part of methamine or cycloguanine, another anti malarial drug, make these kind of hybrids. So I will concentrate today on this kind of hybrid. You have this portion comes from chloroquine and this portion comes from these two anti malarial drugs. So we made that. So this molecule, wherein we have aminoquinoline and triazine were prepared, three of molecules were prepared, and this is the IC50 value of chloroquine. 
some of the molecules showed better IC50 value than chloroquine. So what we proved here that if you hybridize these kind of different kind of pharmacophore, you can improve the in vitro anti-malarial activity of the resulting compound. So as a medicinal chemist, what we are criticized for that humko chemistry nahi aati hai. To hum chote chote chise karte hai. In India at least it is famous actually. If you go to funding agencies, they will say isme kuch chemistry hai hi nahi. Right? This is what the normal problem. So as a medicinal chemist, what we thought, substitute this nitrogen by CH, make it a primidine. Let's see what happens. So we did that. So it is a synthesis here. You get two regioisomers, one is major, another minor. Separated that. Separation of these regioisomers is really, really tough. It takes five to six days to separate it in color. Got the crystal structure. The major isomer was reacted with a secondary cyclic amines at this position. Let me show you the some data. So if you compare these two regioisomers here, what is the difference? Difference is the connectivity of this part with this part. In this case, the connectivity is between this carbon, which is flanked by two nitrogens. In this case, this one. One is major, another is minor. So activity is almost same. So when activity is same, it is a good news for at least the students, because if minor compound ke activity is more, then the boss will know that it will be made. So, if you don't want to make it, you don't want to make it. So, we will be tired every day. So, activity is a big compound, there was a lot of yield. We converted it. Look at it from here now. This compound, sorry, this compound. What is the structural difference here? This one, the morphine, and ethyl piprazine, and ethyl piprazine. 0.21, 0.026, 0.025. Here, so we have three of compounds there. I just showed here the representative examples. So we have a molecule at seven nanomolar. So if you present it, or if you want to write a research paper, they will say, what about the in vivo? So if you are working in the university system, to work in the university system or the college system is the biggest challenge, right? Koi tumare saath aayega nahi. When I joined the university, I asked the CDI, can you collaborate in this or no? So we collaborated somewhere else. We do not have NMR at that time, but we kept on doing. We did the in vivo activity. The in vivo activity is 30 milligram per kg body weight. Sorry, 80% cure. We published this result in ACS Medicinal Chemistry later and filed a patent in 2012. Then as usual, lead optimization, that's the central molecule. Many things change the world. But I will talk about only one set of compound out of this. So if you look at it, these two pharmacophores are connected by this linker, which is called a flexible linker. What we did here? We put the piprazine in between. So the linker becomes very rigid now. Okay? In another case, the flexibility was introduced, but piprazine is kept. Now, if you look at the data, what happens? Activity drops and then improves. And here, we have 100% cure. Same dose here. Then we moved ahead. This is a beautiful example for a student point of view. This is amodiazine. If you remember what I said, drug development, it's not difficult. Hai. Right? You remember that slide, right? So this molecule was introduced in the market for the treatment of malaria, was considered to be better than chloroquine, but after a few years, it was withdrawn from the market. So us company ka to bhagwani malik hoga fir, right? Kitna loss hoga usko. Why it was withdrawn? It was withdrawn because it has a liver toxicity. What happened? This molecule metabolized in the liver from this kind of metabolite and which is liver toxic. Was this information not available at that time when it was introduced? That's not answer. It was available, sorry. So 
it was available. This is the paracetamol. Paracetamol shows legal toxicity, forms this kind of molecule. Look at this structure and that structure. But people, when this molecule was designed, they did not pay attention to that knowledge. Now, if you want to stop the toxicity of this molecule, as a chemist, what you can think? Just swipe the position of these two. If you swipe the position of these two, you won't get this. But whether it will remain anti-malarial or not, that's the billion dollar question, which you cannot predict. Number one. Number two, you can substitute this with similar size of atoms, like fluorine. This one. So it won't form this metabolite. And this was proof, this compound shows better antimalarial activity. What we did here? So this was our molecule which I showed you before. Now what we did from this portion, whole this portion was kept intact. This N-diethyl group was substituted from this pharmacophore which we already had. So we made those compounds. Synthesis is depicted here. What is the difference between the amodiapine and our, our compound is this one. That part. Rest of the part is same. I'm not showing the in vitro data. It's a hundred percent cure. Better stable than amodiapine as expected. This is what we expected. So we got it. Around the same time in 2012, when we published this paper, one fine morning I received an email from Professor Kim in McLean Hospital. He wanted to screen these compounds for Parkinson. What was the motivation of doing so? The motivation was from this paper. This paper published in 1987 by Sanders concludes that chloroquine and related molecules can retard the progression of Parkinson's disease, but no follow -up. Our molecule has structural identity weakness, number one. Number two, we proved that our molecule was much better for malaria model than chloroquine. And he sent us the data wherein he screened 960 FDA approved drugs, found three hits, all these three hits as four amino chlorine pharmacophore. So we thought, let's take this opportunity, let's screen these compounds for Parkinson model. Let me just tell you the students, what is Parkinson? Parkinson is the neurodegenerative disease, okay? And its symptoms are tremor, rigidity, and slowness of movement. And there is no drug available for the treatment of Parkinson. For student information, human adult human brain, male human brain, has more than 86 billion neurons. And no of the, none of the neurons makes up physical contact. They in pass the information through this space, it is called synapse. So you can now think how many synapses will be there. So it's very, very challenging. One of the neuron is dopamine neuron. A dopamine neuron is responsible for the release of dopamine in your midbrain, substantia nigra part. And this diagram shows it's a normal, healthy human being. You have dopamine neuron. It releases dopamine. And this is protein called alpha synuclein. It looks like this. You are healthy. But if you have a Parkinson, what happens? The dopamine neuron dies. You don't have a dopamine here. You have a moment disorder. Not only that, this protein undergoes for misfolding, forms these kind of lumps. That aggravates the disease. So if you want to make a molecule which can treat the Parkinson disease, what you'll be looking for? Stop the death of this dopamine neuron. If you can do that, you can generate a molecule which has a Parkinson potential. Or 
stop the aggregation of this. There are many other targets which people are working on. But what we work on, there is a receptor called Norman receptor. Till 2015, people thought this receptor is an orphan receptor. Biochemistry, you have medicine chemistry. Orphan receptor means the receptor which does not have a binding pocket. Okay? But later, very recently, people found, no, it has a binding pocket and a mystery molecule activates it. When Nervon activation takes place, the dopamine death, no, dopamine neurons death get arrested. So it means if you want to activate this Nervon, you need a molecule which can fit in that very tight binding pocket of the Nervon receptor, number one. Number two, you can stop the aggregation of this. So this is what it happens when you have a Parkinson's disease. This is the healthy brain, the red part. And if you have a Parkinson, the red part looks like this. These are the symptoms which people can see. But there are many more symptoms which a patient can realize. Nobody can even see that. This is called iceberg, Parkinson iceberg. So at, at this stage, fifth stage, you are wheelchair bound. Can't do anything. Unfortunately, there is no drug available. The L-DOPA and related compounds which are given, it, is, it manages the disease. But as soon as the disease progression takes place, it becomes ineffective. So person is there to die. So we started working on this project. Initially, we sent these two series of compounds. Look at the difference the pyrimidine and triazine. The triazine were totally inactive. Many of us know when we work on a medicinal chemistry, you can draw kind of, once you have a molecule, hit molecule, make a changes, we call it a SAR study, structure activity relation, and it makes a correlation. But in this particular case, Till now, we are not able to draw a complete SAR. Small change leads to complete loss of the activity. And this is what of the comment from the reviewer in Nature Communication was that they said it's a black box. Because we claimed there that we screened 570 new molecules. And this is what the data is. And data doesn't make much sense in terms of the SAR. And that was funded by MJ Fox Foundation in 2014. Then we screened, this is the EC50 value for chloroquine, 50 micromolar. Our compound as low as 0.5 nanomolar. Not one compound, we have 15 such compounds which, is, which EC50 value is less than 5 or 10 nanomolar. So how we got this molecule? This molecule we published in RSC Advances in 2015 for malaria. And my collaborator wanted this in higher quantity to do some more biomass. So I asked my student, he joined at that time, to make it in one gram CL. He did the reaction. On fine evening he came, he said, I have an 8 milligram compound or mila. 8 milligram. So I said, uh, let's try to find out the structure of it. We did the structure. We found that we got this molecule, 8 gram scale, mein, 8 milligram. The maximum PhD students, so thank you. Right? Then characterize, we send it for the screening, what we got. 0.5 nanomolar. What was it? Yield come ho gai, usi ko banane ga, ab ab isko banao bhaiya. Ab isko banao. Right? To wo bhi sochta tha, usmein kyun bata diya hai khali. Kuch jaan na jaan aage. But we improvised the synthesis, we got this molecule. And this molecule is a part of nature communication now. Another series, 0.1 nanomolar. Battery of compounds. 
Now let me show you some of the biology data which I am not a master of. जो मेरे कॉलेबरेटर ने किया उनसे जो मैंने पूछा जो सीखा उसके हिसाब से एक्सप्लेन करूंगा सो दिस इज दूसीज एंजाइम यूजिंग नॉर्मल लिगन बाइंड डोमेन सो क्लोरोक्विन एक्टिवेट इज हंड्रेड माइक्रोमोलर अवर कंपाउंड इज ट्वेंटी तो फाइव टाइम्स बेटर दिस इज यूजिंग फुल लेंथ ऑफ नॉर्मल सेम रिजल्ट एंड दिस इज इंटरेस्टिंग एक्चुअली टू अंडरस्टैंड यू कैन सी द ग्रीन एंड रेड डॉट्स इ The students, can you see the red and red dots and green dots here? Okay. Now, compare these red dots with this. Red dots has depleted now. Come over. What happened? We treated this with NPTP compound. That causes a Parkinson disease. Means, वो आपके जो dopamine neuron है उसको death कर देगा. तो dopamine कम हो गया. So this is what it shows. Same is Under model. Now, when this was treated with the chloroquine, you can see little bit more red dots here. But when this is treated with our compound, look at the red dots. So, what we proved from this study that it completely arrest the death of dopamine neurons. So, dopamine neuron ki agar death arrest ho gayi, to aapka dopamine concentration badh jayega. So, you will feel happy. This is the structure of the compound. So this is the seratum part of the mice. Okay, the mice was injected this molecule. It causes Parkinson. Look at the seratum part of the brain. This is how it looks. When this is treated with L-dopa, not a significant change, which is expected. But when this is treated with our compound, look at the first and the last one. Almost identical. So this is what we proved that it works in vivo as well. And this is very interesting actually. Autophagy, students, कितने लोगों ने सुना था? Autophagy, yeah. So autophagy में 2015 में Nobel Prize मिला है. Okay? In layman terms, what it says that when your cells are under stress. They will eat the dead cells or the cells that causes the disease. शायद इसीलिए हमारे यहाँ कहा गया है हमारे संत जो हजार साल जीते थे क्योंकि वो खाते ही नहीं थे हम try करेंगे क्या होगा मुझे पता नहीं but the fasting helps actually okay so if your molecule induce the autophagy that's the additional advantage for you what it is doing. You see, there are red dots and yellow dots. When this was treated with this compound, it stops the autophagy. When this is treated with chloroquine, few red dots comes, and chloroquine is known to stop the autophagy. But if you look at this one, this is when this is treated with our compound, you can see more red dots. What we proved here, we proved that our molecule induce autophagy. So this molecule does. Please, I think I forgot to show you this. Okay, this is another model. In this case, we this is the vehicle again, and this one is with alpha synuclein misfolding. So when alpha synuclein misfolding takes place, it brain looks like this. But when it is treated with this, comes out. So this molecule actually is doing three different things. One, stop activates the nerve one. Stops the death of the dopamine neuron. Number one. Number two, it induces autophagy, and it stops the aggregation of alpha synuclein. So we wanted to have one property in the molecule, but we got three. So this was recently published in July you know, last year in Nature Communication. So where are we now? We are at this stage. This molecule has entered. For phase one human clinical trial, and trials are going on in the United States. The many patents we got. It activates nerve one, stops the aggregation of alpha synuclein. It helps autophagy. So these are the bunch of people who work on this project. Tireless. It's very difficult project. It's not that easy because.
the ratio isomer separation is really, really tough. And these are the three molecules now listed on the website of this company to which we have uh, agreement now. And SIVA is continuing this work because recently we got the grant from this company to generate the second generation of uh, those molecules. And it is the media relations of uh, about the progress of these molecules. The story was covered by Bloomberg where it says our molecule ATS 399A has progressed to human phase one clinical trial. Wall Street Journal also covered the story in October 2023. So, 2012 में पार्किंसन का काम शुरू किया था, right? पेपर कब आया? 2023 में। कोई पीएसजी स्टूडेंट रहेगा आपके साथ? सब भाग जाएंगे, right? तो इन बिटवीन कहा कि यार कुछ और कर लो, तुमको पेपर भी मिलते रहे। So I started, I never, I never experienced this actually, I never work on this area, but we started working on nano catalysis methodology, made a significant contribution on this. We published about 12 or 13 papers in ACS Sustainable Chemistry 9.1 or 4 impact factor. And many of this has been highlighted by Synfect and appeared in the cover page of the journals. So, Lion is still alive. Vice Chancellor ban gaya toh koshish karte hain ki karte rahe. So, these in last seven months, this paper OL just came yesterday night actually. About the GOC, then ACS, uh, advanced synthesis and catalysis and tetrahedral letter also came last week only. This, the, all the malaria work was collaborated with Dr. Shamana Khan from University of Mississippi because when I joined, there was nobody who could collaborate with me actually. This is what it happens. Now many people want to collaborate, now I don't have a time. And the Parkinson work is done by uh, Professor uh, Kim at Harvard and McLean. Funding came from all these. Maximum grant from Government of India, I got 36 lakhs. With an unsolicited comment in my section later in 2012 that PI must change the routine area of work. That was written in the sanction later. Then when I made a presentation on this to DST, so-called empowered committee, they gave me good grade. Excellent, very good, good, satisfactory. So Nietzsche so A Cooper. And that routine work has gone to human clinical trial. So this is what we are actually. <laughs> then, so I am here. So clap is for all those people actually. About 40 people work with me till now. And this is the uh, group which is continuing. Jane se pehle Delhi Nusri ko nature communication diya. Jane ke do din pehle 86 lakh ki grant laya. Then I went to Vice Chancellor Saab, but to ma jara hao, to PhD student de do. To na ka ni aap chutti pejara, aapko PhD student ni mil sakta. This is what we are. I don't know who is the loser that I don't understand. So this is what we are, this is why we don't progress. Okay? Jab ma apni industry ma gaya, wohan bhi ek vice chancellor bane, dousre din rule change kiya, he can do anything he wants in this university because if you go, it's my loss, academically. So I, I love that. Well, so this is the village from I, I come from. It is about 130, 40 kilometer from Nanital towards Himalaya. If I open the door of my house, this is how the Himalaya looks like. And I studied from this place until class 9th, students, okay? And this place was my school, the up to 9th. Yahan se to nazdik dikh raha hai, ye lagbog 4 kilometer steep down. So we have to go steep down, then steep up. And at that time, my place doesn't have the drinking water. Under one kilometer, you have to go to bring the drinking water. So from this place, I come from. And thank you very much for your patience here. Thank you. OK. Dr. Rawa, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I really liked, I really liked how you talked about where you came from and how you went back there. And then you showed us your lovely home.
So that's a nice touch. I think we should incorporate some of those things in our presentations in the United States. Do we have any time for questions? Okay, thank you. So, wow, wonderful, lots of great chemistry there. Um, I was thinking a lot about the, the, the medical, the clinical perspectives on this, the global health perspectives as neurodegenerative diseases, as I said before, are just increasing, right? We're seeing a lot of these. So uh, I'll first ask if anybody has any questions in the audience, and he's got the microphone there. Yes, okay. yes, question, question here. Uh, in early 80s, I worked on MPP plus, and I noticed that the cells were dying very quickly, actually. Hmm. So when you were using the MPP plus, was it a cell line or an animal model? Or no, no, we did both, actually. The first one was the in cell lines, then the mice model. It was injected, actually. When it, you inject it, then you see the Parkinson's symptoms. Yeah, right. actually you inject MPTP, which gets converted into MPP plus. Yes, plus, yes. Uh, very inspiring talk, sir. Sir, I want to know that uh, the molecule which you have tested for alpha synchrolin aggregation, so have you uh, investigated its inhibition mechanism, like how it is inhibiting the aggregation of alpha synchrolin? No, we have done that in nature communication. All that data is there. Okay, yeah, okay. Because sir. of the time, I didn't, sir. Yeah, okay. All the data, because nature communication, I never realized they asked these many questions. <laughs> Okay, the minor revision, after minor revision, they put in a major revision actually. Okay. So all those questions, yes. Thank you so much, sir, thank you. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, sir, uh, thank you for making chemistry so interesting for the first time. To me, I am uh, from biology background. Uh, sir, I want to ask that this molecule, uh, does it uh, perform apoptosis uh, against, uh, like uh, it um, works uh, for, uh, uh, this particular disease only, or is it applicable for other cells also? And do, uh, does it have side effects? No, actually now the Alzheimer, as I showed, autoimmune, Lewis bodies. These studies are going on. I have not covered that. Okay. So what we have shown that this, this part is done, and it has been taken over there. But in uh, your uh, dementia and all that, it is being studied. Okay, now uh, your another question that this uh, you wanted to talk about cancer, yes, sir. right? Uh, the MO diagon molecule which I showed you, this is why chemistry is beautiful actually, right? Madam, huh? biology, wale. <laughs> so I always, I, I always say because drug discovery is not one person task, right? The major is the chemistry and biology, and chemistry and biology is a husband wife relationship actually. Right. Keep on fighting. <laughs> right. Or the fighting ni hoti to molecule acha mil jata hai. Humne ka compound ye banaya itna active aa gaya dobara bana ke diya kehta kuch nahi aaya. Theek hai. Aur fir uske baad tum kahaniyan suno idhar dusro mein. Right. That but in this amodiacin when we made the compound the first step the pyrimidine and aminokidin it induced the cancer. Cancer to induce cancer. Okay? When we put the CL, the one CL substituted, it inhibit. Another CL is substituted, it kills the cancer. We have that data also, but could not publish. The student chala gaya. So there are many things. So that's a beautiful chemistry which I have not presented here. नहीं आज आजकल यही काम कर रहा हूँ आजकल यही कर रहा हूँ जहाँ जा रहा हूँ बाहर नहीं जाता हूँ क्या क्या पता कोई जा गया so in our lab also we are synthesizing the fluorinated molecules and I was wondering that some in some of the molecules you have introduced fluorine so what strategy you have used to introduce fluorine whether it was direct or indirect fluorination or any reagent you have used मैंने आप मुझे पता आप फ्लोरिन पर काफी तो मैं फ्लोरिन इंट्रोड्यूस ही नहीं किया मैंने कंपाउंड खरीद लिया दिस इन डर वी डिड इट यस प्लीज यस मैंने इतने सवाल का मतलब ना उस मुशा जो मुशायरे गाता है ना वो खुश हो जाता है है ना कि यहाँ इसका मतलब इंटरेस्ट है हाँ इट वाज वंडरफुल टॉक सर my question is going to talk about the tyrosine. 
Pyrazine, when you use that time, uh, your activity was reduced, right? But in case of the crude hydrogen, like pyrimidine, it was a good activity. What about the pyridine? Brilliant question. Well, student has not made it. I have said it too, but I have not made it. Well, that's a good thing to study with. So we'll be looking at it. Very interesting and inspiring, sir. So one question, uh, have you studied or planning to study uh, what is the mechanism of upregulation of NER1? Uh, because that would be very, very interesting. Yeah, uh, that I have not thought. My biologist counterpart, <laughs> so change <changes. laughs> Yes. We are open to collaboration. Yeah, thank you. And actually, my daughter is also sitting somewhere. So she will make a comment after this. After sab kare pahot acha bol raha hu, mere ko batayegi ki baad mein kya bola tha. Okay, any other questions? I'm hearing some noises and bhangra, something back here. So, uh, yeah, but okay. So, any other questions before we finish up today? Okay, w wonderful. Let's give him another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Dawa, sir. Thank you, Rohit, sir. Now, I would like to conclude the session with gratitude to all. Thank you for the active participation. Your presence has enriched our session. I request you all delegates and participants to join the tea break after that we will gather in Pacific Ground for a cultural event. <laughs>